Okay, welcome and good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to have you all here. Um, I'm Jamie Schumpf. I'm the president of NYC CBT. And right now we are starting our workshop with esteemed colleague, Dr. Scott. Oh, Bell. that's so nice. He is a clinician, an international trainer and practice-based researcher. He's certified as a qualified cognitive therapist and trainer consultant by the Academy of Cognitive and Behavior Therapies. He's also a board member of the International Association of Cognitive Psychotherapy. He's, a board, certifi he's board certified in cognitive and behavioral psychology from the American Board of Professional Psychology. That is a mouthful. And he recently co-authored the book, Socratic Questioning for Therapists and Counselors, How to Learn and Think and intervene like a cognitive behavior therapist. So before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Any questions that come up, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat. And regarding CEs, once the webinar ends, it takes about five minutes for Zoom to track everyone's conference attendance. And then once it is tracked, the send a link out um, that says to uh, attendee dashboard. The dashboard is just a website specific to you. And on the dashboard, you will be able to access content, complete your evaluations and download your CE certificate. Okay, so without further ado, Excited to hear Scott's presentation today. Thanks. Oh, Jamie, that was so nice of you. I should have Jamie always introduce me. That's better than how I introduce myself. Well, I am super excited to be here. This is very exciting. I'm currently in Texas, which I feel like I should say the great state of Texas. It's all right. Um, but I'm excited to be here. And I'm going to share some slides. We're about we're heading into our sophomore year of um, the pandemic, and I'm pretty good at Zoom right now. So let's see if I can get it up. So I shared it and then I'm gonna to come to a slideshow and I'm gonna, from the beginning, and then I'm gonna change it to, there we go. All right. I am now uh, an expert, expert at this thing. So good morning, welcome, welcome to uh, our training today. So there will be uh, at the end a time for questions, although along the way, if you do have questions, you can put them into the Q&A box and we'll periodically pause to see if there are any questions. Um, we do have time for some breaks. I'll be going over the schedule as well. So today we're talking about Socratic dialogue, Socratic questioning, and this is kind of an advanced training. So this isn't just the basics of Socratic questioning, but we're focusing on how to use Socratic questioning to change core beliefs and schema. So there are there are handouts available. They, they will be linked to the um, the CE um, site as well with your portal. All right. So learning objectives. What are we looking to cover today? So we want to talk about uh, conceptualizing the beliefs that we're evaluating. We want to talk about um, how to look to see what are the, the what's maintaining these beliefs. So what are the schematic filters? What are the behavior patterns? Not uh, not just why do they think this, but why do they still think this? And then we're trying to organize interventions across treatment to bring about large schematic change. So there's uh, some kind of higher orders Socratic skills we're talking about today. This is our schedule. Uh, it's flexible, but roughly the ideas we'll talk for about an hour, covering the, the, the basics of the framework with an applied example, we'll take a break. We'll come back, we'll have a role play and debrief the role play. Then we're gonna move into talking about core belief work and have a, a, an applied discussion of that. And then we're gonna have a break again. And then we're gonna come back and talk more about core belief work. So we're first we're talking what in session and then we're talking across sessions. So what are you doing moment to moment? And what are you doing session to session across the work? And then we'll have time for another role play as well. And there'll also be a final place for questions and answers. I do have a financial disclosure to make. So the book, Socratic Questioning for Therapists and Counselors is 
something I make royalties off of. So I have a, a vested interest in presenting it in a good light, it's something just to be aware of. Uh, it is a very pretty cover, right? So I had to, I had a Canadian artist uh, make this. It's kind of a safety behavior on my part. I was afraid people might not like the book. And so I put a lot of time and energy into making a very, very pretty copy. It's uh, Dr. Beck and Socrates having a tea party, having, I'm sure, a really nice conversation. Uh, I had to get I had to get Dr. Beck's permission for that. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, but so the book is out. Um, uh, Bob Leahy wrote a foreword for it. It's a very good forward, but I'm I'm not going to talk more about this. But there, I think there's information about this in the handouts. So, guided discovery, Socratic questioning, collaborative empiricism. These are all overlapping terms that are slightly unique. Uh, and they speak to kind of the, the heart of what CBT is. So I'm, it's nice to speak to uh, NYC CBT. They have a, a group of true believers. It makes it easier to, to get into the weeds with this. So on the cognitive therapy rating scale, that one of the measures we use to look at CBT competency, guided discovery is its own item. In Beck's early writings, he first sp spoke about collaborative empiricism as, as a core idea of what CBT is. So CBT is applying scientific curiosity to our client's thinking, but we do this collaboratively. So this is different than other kinds of therapies where there's a hierarchical relationship where the therapist is the expert and the client um, is, is the recipient of our expertise. The, the idea is, is we wanna to join together with the client collaboratively to teach them skills and help them apply the scientific curiosity to their thought and behavior patterns. And we do this with directly with Socratic questioning, and we also fold this into behavioral strategies and most work that we do. Right? The, the goal is, is to teach the client to be their own therapist, and so we have to help them learn how to think and how to work and how to get there on their own. Uh, we think that this leads to a deeper level of learning and change. People uh, have very strong feelings about Socratic questioning. They like it a lot. We don't actually know that it leads to a deeper level of change yet. The research hasn't been done to show that. Uh, one of the reasons the research hasn't been done to show that yet is that uh, it's been harder to study Socratic questioning until more recently. So recently there's been a few measures that have been developed for Socratic questioning. Uh, Braun and colleagues have a measure that looks at how much Socratic questioning happens in a session. Christine Podesky came out with the Socratic Dialogue Rating Scale, which is uh, it's fashioned in the way of the CTRS for Socratic questioning related to her model, which is a good way to fold it into research. Uh, we also came out with the Socratic Dialogue Rating Matrix, uh, which is kind of a different format for that similar idea, but it's more looking at how are you balancing collaboration and empiricism in your, in your uh, guided discovery. Uh, but now there's measures, it's easier to research, and hopefully we get more research. Um, there is some research that has been done showing that uh, in CBT for depression, when they look at the sessions where there is Socratic questioning happening, that Socratic questioning is predictive of decreases in symptoms in the next session. Those findings hold true even after controlling for the relationship. Uh, they've done some more research showing that um, some people might need it more than others or more or on the other side some people might not need it as much as others so people who are unmedicated people who are more pessimistic might need more socratic questioning than, than others though so christine and i were talking about that article and we noted that they were looking at the the, the amount of socratic questioning and not the quality of socratic questioning so there's probably some nuance that needs to be found um, also in the in the cognitive processing therapy C CBT for PTSD research, there is research showing that the better quality and competency of the Socratic questioning uh, is predictive of decreases in PTSD symptoms as well. But we need more research. If anyone here wants to do research, definitely reach out to me and I will help you get connected with measures and I will be very happy to cheerlead you because I would love, love to get more research and love to learn more. <laughs> So uh, let's see, so how did we get here? So a little bit of a story. So this is kind of the story of how I tried to do less work and ended up doing more work, um, but learned stuff along the way. So currently I'm in Texas as a clinician and a trainer. Uh, before coming to Texas, I was in Philadelphia. I worked at Penn at what is now the Penn Collaboration was previously the Beck 
initiative. Uh, it was a, a partnership between the R&T Back Psychopathology Research Center and the City of Philadelphia Community Behavioral Health System. Uh, and there we were training community, be health, community behavioral health therapists in how to do high quality CBT. And part of this process was we would give them intensive training and then we would provide ongoing clinical case consultation and we would listen to their audios and we would rate their audios to see uh, how were they doing, what do they need help with, try and give them targeted uh, advice and guidance on how to improve. And one day I was talking with one of the other trainers and I said something to the effect of, well, have you ever noticed that we, we tend to kind of always like write the same feedback over and over again? Uh, and they were like, yeah. And I was like, why, why do we do that? Why don't we figure out what this feedback is and then we can give this to people on the front end? And my, the hubris in my mind is, well, if we just tell them like, here's the mistakes you make, don't make them, then it'll be less work for me because I won't have to keep typing it. Uh, and they were like, no, 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 Scott, that's too much work. We don't, we don't have time to do that kind of research project. And so I talked them into like, look, this is more work now, but less work later. Like if we do this, we figure out what it is, we can give them the, the feedback, then they know what to work on. Because people typically, you know, on the first audio, you're giving them a lot of feedback related to, well, you got to set an agenda, here's the structure, here's how you do this, you got to use your focusing skills. And then you can start moving into the more exciting feedback later on. So we did a research study, but the idea was, is we didn't want our findings to just be about our curriculum. We wanted to look about CBT learning in, in general. So we partnered with another large scale CBT training program. Uh, the Academy of Cognitive and Behavior Therapy has a partnership with the LA County Department of, May of Mental Health, where they're doing a similar rollout training community, me community mental health therapists in high quality CBT. So we partnered with them to look at what are the common places people are getting stuck? How do things improve? What are the types of uh, stuck points or mistakes that you're seeing? Which was a lot of fun to do if you're someone who's kind of a CBT nerd. So um, the data, right? So this was a mixed method study. So the, the data from a, a, a mathematical perspective is this. So we have on the left, the CTRS data. So this is, for people who are familiar with the CTRS, we organized the, the, the interview and the information around the CTRS because this is what all the trainers were using. So we have agenda, feedback, understanding, interpersonal effectiveness, and so on. So you can see I have guided discovery uh, as different color to call attention to this. So this is the one that everyone said, yes, we see this is the thing that everyone has problems with. But there's other things that people, there were high amounts of problems with, right? Like agenda, most people had problems with setting agenda. But when you look at, when you compare this with how was the improvement? So a lot of people have trouble with agenda, but a lot of people get really good at setting agendas if you teach them how to do it. Very concrete skill, you learn how to do it, you can do it really well. Whereas with guided discovery, a lot of people had trouble with, with guided discovery, Socratic questioning, collaborative empiricism. But the improvement wasn't what we wanted to see, right? So we, we would hope to see, okay, people have challenges. We notice they have challenges. We do targeted training, people get better. What we found was a lot of people have challenges. We notice they have challenges. We do targeted training and they improve, but not as much as we want them to improve. And this is not the finding we wanted to find, right? We wanted to find that people uh, had some pitfalls they make. We could tell them how to do it and quickly things turn around. So we had to kind of think through it. So some of the commonly observed difficulties that we saw from the qualitative side of the study. So trainer four, I don't know who this is because we animized it. I wish I did because I love this term. So they coined the term provided discovery. So guided discovery is rejoining with the client to find the truth together, right? We're not saying here's, I'm right, look at my, look at my right answer, we're saying, I can teach you skills, let's collaborate, let's, let's get some data, let's study this together. We're both scientists. So too much provided discovery. So too much of trying to tell the client, well, don't you think this is the way to look at it? Or haven't you considered this? Or maybe this is the right answer, which there's value in that, but it's not quite the same as guided discovery, right? It's not quite the same as collaborative empiricism, the, the core idea of cognitive therapy. 
Other common difficulties we saw was that people uh, would fall into advice giving. So the people that we were training aren't just, just people who are new to, to counseling or therapy, but it was also people who were, were retraining or were through implementation and dissemination efforts were, were not CBTers, but were coming to learn CBT. So these are folks who had had a lot of experience with advice giving and counseling, and it was hard for them to shift from counseling and telling the client, here's what you need to do, here's how you need to think about it, to okay, maybe I don't have the answers either, but I have skills and we can learn the answers together. It's a different, it's a different kind of perspective. It takes more work, it requires some vulnerability. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. And the, the, the third thing that we found, I'm just gonna read this because I think people are probably reading it because it's kind of long. Um, so it says, this is one of the hardest skills. So naturally trainees struggle with it. They seem to do okay when it's in the context of a specific intervention, for example, three C's. Now the three C's is a simplified uh, cognitive restructuring strategy developed for people with dementia. So it's very much an oversimplified skill. This is catch it, check it, change it. So people could, could learn to do um, a simplified skill pretty well. They could learn a list of questions to ask but they had a hard time adopting the skill of taking a stance of sky discovery throughout the session or across the sessions. So really understanding the spirit of it and doing it in a flexible, nuanced way was harder for them to do. So as trainers, this was great information for us to get. It wasn't what we wanted to find though, right? We wanted to find out that people just had like some small mistakes and we could teach them how to make mistakes and then they were great. But you, you get data and you gotta do something with the data. So if we look at kind of how to fit this in together, this is, I have a few kind of like Instagram graphics in here. They're just, they're just prettier than my PowerPoint uh, graphics. So um, the idea is we're looking at uh, collaboration and empiricism and how do they fit together, right? So ideally we want people down here in the bottom, right? We want people with high collaboration, high empiricism. So collaborative empiricism, jointly discovering, fostering motivation, bringing about change, that's, that's the sweet spot. For clinicians who have a low collaboration and high empiricism, this is where people are disputing, they're challenging thoughts, they're trying to show the client where they're wrong. They're um, providing reframes as interpretations. Here's, here's the answer, let me tell you. And they might be right, but it's not good collaboration. It's not how we teach people to, to come to new perspectives on their own. On the other side, someone who has low empiricism but high collaboration, this might be more supportive therapy, perhaps even colluding at times with the client. And then low empiricism, low collaboration, that, that's kind of unlikely you'd run into that kind of presentation because usually therapists are gonna at least be really relationshipally oriented because it's a, it's a core skill that goes with us. So let me pause right now because I think there might be some questions that have came in uh, before I keep talking along. Have, have we had any questions? Nope, not yet. We're all good. Oh, good. Okay, I can see the I can see the chat box. I, I have anxieties, but I'm all right. I can tolerate anxiety. It's mostly seat. related to the the worksheets and everything. Oh, good. Everyone's saying, "Where are the handouts? How do we get the handouts?" I know that. I've been in these trainings before. Okay, well, they're they're available. You'll get them. All right. So let me keep talking. So, um. So we had this idea of people have these kind of problems. So we said, well, we got to retool how we go about teaching the skills. So um, what, um, I'll pull it over here. So Christine Podesky, brilliant, 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 uh, gave a talk on Socratic dialogue at the 1993 um, conference of the uh, European Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Uh, it's a lovely talk. If you Google Podesky Socratic questioning, it'll it'll be like the first hit, and it's definitely worth reading. She has it freely available on her website. If you can't find it, you can email me, and I'll direct you to the to her website where the link is. So you can get it. But there, she talked about um, Socratic dialogue as not just questions we ask, but a conversation that we have. Right? We're we're asking questions. We're listening to what the client says. We're summarizing, and then we're asking synthesizing your analytical questions to help look at things they might be missing, things that seem to be contradictions, things that seem to not make sense. It's a beautiful model. So uh, Trent Codd and myself, we, we did a research study where we said, well, we're trying to teach people how to follow this model. Maybe we got to learn how do the people that do it well, how do they do it? We were trying to develop like a stage model tool to help people work through her model. 
So we did another qualitative study and we, where we looked at people who, who weren't new to CBT, but people who had been doing CBT for a while, right? People who were, who were trainers, people who were fellows, people who were, who were really good. And so we, we studied them and, and interviewed them. And what we found was not what we wanted to find, right? So we were hoping that they could say, hey, here's what I do, bing, bang, boom. And then we could be like, all right, here's the measure. And then we got it. What we found was that they weren't actually doing it the way that we thought they were doing it. They weren't following Podesky's model, which was annoying because it would have been less work if they were. So we had the, the, the dilemma, right? Did we try and um, create a... a when it, we were trying to get people to use Podesky's model and we were trying to teach it, but people were having a hard time learning it. And then the people that who were good at it weren't doing this. And then there were stuck points or mistakes people were making that were different. So we did the thing that was more work. Um, we ended up revising the models. So we said, well, we, this is a good model, but can we tweak this to make this work in a way where it's, where we, it's more teachable to the process and it, it helps correct for some of the common pitfalls people can make. So that's why there's that's why there's two models that exist. So the the first step in our model is focusing. So so one of the other uh, common mistakes I didn't talk about and the focusing item of the CTRS was people didn't know what to go after. So oftentimes when people are new to CBT, they get this idea that CBT is a short-term therapy. They learn, look, here's a list of distortions. They they get this idea of challenging their clients. And they want to challenge every distortion that they see, where they become like the distortion police, where as they see something that sounds negative, sounds distorted, they tend to kind of jump on it and jump on it and jump on it, which sounds good in theory, but the unintended consequence of that is you're constantly changing your focus because you're, there's a lot of shiny stuff. And if you're going after everything, you're not really going after anything because you're not staying with one thing long enough to really do anything which I'm sure trainers on this call have given that feedback to people in the past. They've said, I, you were working really, really hard, but you kept changing directions. So you never actually got anywhere. Uh, let's help you slow down. Let's help you catch your breath. Let's think strategically. So the, the idea of focusing is, is part of the dialogue is figuring out well, what are we going after here? And then once we know what we're going after, then we're going to lead with understanding. This is a strategy to correct for provided discovery. So provided discovery is trying to help, trying to get the client to see it from our point of view, trying to show them that we're right, trying to show them that we have the answers. Uh, understanding is gonna be flipping it around and trying to help, trying to first see it from their point of view, first see how it makes sense. So it's a, a deliberate counterbalancing for that process. And then once we see it from their point of view, then we're gonna try and expand that point of view together with collaborative curiosity. Finally, we're going to tie it together with a summary and a synthesis. So if you were to listen to someone following either of these models, it would sound really, really similar. There's not a giant difference in implementation. It's more a difference in how it's taught, uh, which is to help uh, correct for some of the things that we observed. So let's walk, let me walk you through a case example to make this less abstract. I know it's Early here, it's not quite as early there, but it's still pretty early. So I'll walk you through a case example to make this make more sense. So here are some more graphics. You can see I have a CBT Instagram, Socratic Method CBT. I have some Instagram graphics just because it's Instagram is just prettier than PowerPoint. And sometimes it's nice to have pretty things. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through a case. Given the nature of this training and how private or not private it is, this isn't going to be uh, a, a real, uh, honest, honest, every detail client because that would not be a clinically appropriate to go through. So this will be pseudo clientized or fictionalized client to uh, help hide their anonymity. Some. So we have the model, right? So first we start out with focusing, delving to see what we're going after, but trying to find the strategic intervention point, moving to understand it from their point of view. Once we see it from their point of view, expanding uh, with curiosity and trying to pull it together. So let me talk a little bit about an example case. I'm gonna write down the fake name that I'm using so I don't forget. I have a chronic intrusive fear of accidentally saying a real client information on one of these. So we'll call her Fiona. So Fiona was an early twenties African-American cisgender female. She came to see me with chronic problems of depression. Um, though she was quite embarrassed to say that she was depressed. 
Um, she grew up in a family where it wasn't okay to be depressed. It wasn't okay to not be okay. And so she, like many people, waited for a long time to come in. She had uh, dealt with and tried to cope with her depression for probably 20 years before coming to see me in her mid-20s. Um, so she uh, grew up in a family where there was a, a lot of emphasis on achievement and there was a de-emphasis de on vulnerability and emotionality. She um, grew up with the idea that other people have, that had similar experiences. So essentially, uh, her dad would tell her at a young age that she was emotional, like, clean yourself up. That's not okay. Not in this house. And so she learned to hide that she was emotional. And because she learned to hide that she was emotional, she learned to relate to people in a very superficial way. And as she learned to relate to people in a very superficial way, she never uh, developed the kind of relationships where you have the, the depth to understand that other people have emotions too. And, and she was so distracted by her own emotional experience that it was hard for her to really pay attention to what, what was going on for other people. And uh, there's this really terrible thing that happens when if you have emotions and you try to deny your emotions or hide from them, they don't go away. In fact, you have more of them. So she was, she had regular human emotions, but then was embarrassed and ashamed that she had them. So now she took regular emotions and then shame on top of that, which adds up to be depression. And she carried this for a long time. And she, she always thought something was wrong with her. She, wasn't, she never felt good enough because she was never really connected with herself or others. And so she developed the compensatory strategy of reinventing herself. She had this idea of, well, if there's something wrong with me, I'll just figure out who has it together and I'll be them, which is really creative. Like, good, good for her to be that creative. So in the environment she's in, she's trying to, to do as well as she can, constantly reinventing herself. Uh, a byproduct of constantly reinventing yourself is uh, you never really develop a good sense of self. Also, as you reinvent yourself, you reinvent your, your friends group, your social network. And so you have a lot of a lot of people you know, but not a lot of people you know well. So things that I would later want to work with her was ideas of like, I'm the only one who has these kind of feelings or something wrong with me. But initially she's, she's not coming in saying like, here's my core belief. Here's what we need to work on. Initially she's coming in saying like, I am not doing okay and I need help and I'm embarrassed that I need help. So first thing we got to do is we got to identify what are we going to work on? So we got to work through some focusing strategies. So let's talk with, let's talk through how do we use some focusing strategies with Fiona? So the first the idea of focusing is we're trying to break the situation down. There's a lot going on and we can't go after everything. So we're trying to figure out where are the situations that are most painful? What are the situations that are most problematic? What are the situations where uh, behavior is most skillful and least skillful? So we have some ideas about where we want to make some changes. We might do some differential diagnosis of thought, which we'll talk about, which is uh, some fun ideas. And then we'll talk about creating a shared definition as well, which is another core idea with um, focusing. So the basic idea of focusing, right, is we're trying to figure out what happened, what's the most exciting part, what's the emotional meaning, we're delving into it to find the target. So it, um, early sessions when Fiona came in, things that she was had challenges with is first there was this idea where she had to admit to me, her therapist, that she had feelings of depression. Uh, and that was really, really really hard for her. So, so she, she was in this place where she had tried to do it on her own for so long. She finally hit the point where she knew that it would be helpful for her to get help. She came in to see me and it was like that. It was almost like it was like, like a word that was illegal to say, right? This was like Voldemort and Harry Potter. Like it was hard for her to say like depression. It's hard for me to be depressed. It was forbidden. So, um, so she comes in, she's like, Dr. Waltman, I need to tell you a secret, which as a therapist, who knows what we're about to get, right? Is this, this could be anything. So I'm like, okay, I'm on, I'm all ready for this. And then she's like, I am depressed. So I go, okay. In my mind, I'm thinking it's going to be like, like a really big secret because clients do that for us periodically, but no, I'm depressed. Okay. So, so you're, so let's talk about that. Right? So you're, you're depressed. No one, this is a secret for you. Why is this a secret? How long has this been a secret? What's it been like to carry this as a secret? We're, of course, leading with a lot of the humanity, empathy, validation, because that's what the person needs right now. It's, it's, as, as, as cognitive therapists, we have cognitive uh, skills, but none of these are more important than the therapeutic relationship. 
right? People will periodically say, well, you know, you can't have, you know, the relationship's more important than the interventions. Of course, I like what Dennis Greenberger says, which is you don't have to choose, right? You could do both. You could have really good rapport, really good relationship skills, and then also use the interventions as well. So I'm being empathic, I'm listening, I'm validating, I'm trying to understand this. And then I'm, I'm looking to see, well, you know, where does this come from? This idea that you were the, that you couldn't tell people this. Like, so where, so where did you first learn this? What happened? So, so this gives us into full story of what happened, right? So we're talking about her childhood. We're talking about what are the parts that led to this idea of, uh, I'm depressed and I can't tell anyone I'm depressed. What are the most upsetting parts? Most upsetting parts are, you know, times when I, when I would be upset and I would cry, my dad would would ground me, he would punish me, he would beat me, he would he would send me away because this was not okay. The emotional meaning of that was that it was it was misbehavior to be emotional. It was misbehavior to show people your your vulnerability or your feelings. And as we got into that, there's this idea, you know, if that was true, that that it was wrong to cry, what would that mean about you if you were crying? If it was wrong to be depressed, what would it mean about you that you were depressed? What would it mean there's something wrong with me? So here's how we get to one of, one of the early targets. So we're looking through kind of what's the story, what are the, what are the most painful parts, what does this mean, and we're delving to try and find it. And there's some questions you can ask right along this process. I'm not necessarily um, a cookbook CBT therapist, so I don't necessarily have a list of questions that I ask everyone, and I don't um, recommend that the people I train do that. I find that I have, I've never had a list of questions that applied to everyone that I worked with or even a single list that applied to one person I work with every time. But here's some questions you can ask yourself to help guide the inquiry. So what are the different parts of the story? So this is helpful if you're like me, if, if there's a lot going on, if you get kind of distracted by the whole story, you, try and, you can try and kind of segment the different parts of the story. So growing, so growing up with dad, um, you know, dad, it, it wasn't very emotional. I wasn't allowed to be emotional. These are different parts. I had my own emotions in the context of this. That's a different part. I was at school and I never saw anyone else be emotional. That's a different part. And as we pull this together, there's the different pieces to it. What's the most upsetting part? Well, the most upsetting part was I was, I had these feelings and I wasn't supposed to have them. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So, no, so I was in pain, but I wasn't supposed to be in pain. This seems to be the one of the core injuries to work with. Uh, where's the heat is another way of kind of euphemizing this with ourselves. So was, as we're kind of following the affect to figure out where it's at. Um, how do they feel about the situation or their different thoughts about it? What, what does this mean to them? Am I missing anything? These are important questions to ask as well. And it might be helpful if I kind of talk through kind of two levels of things I worked on with her just to help kind of think about kind of more like here and now stuff versus more kind of early injury kind of stuff. So here and now stuff, uh, an example of things that would happen would be, you know, she comes home from work and comes home from work, finds that her, uh, her house is a mess, according to her, food, dinner isn't ready. Uh, her husband's watching sports center. He wants to know where dinner is. Uh, the kids uh, need help with their homework. And there's just a lot, right? Like she leaves a very difficult job to come home to a very difficult job and feels very, very overwhelmed by it. So what's the most upsetting part of that for her? For her, the most upsetting part of that was coming home and her, her kids want to need help with homework, but she feels too, too tired to help and she needs, to, she needs to make dinner. She needs to do other things to have to get done. What's the, what's the emotional meaning of that? This idea that your kids want you to help um, and or your kids want to spend time with you, but you, there's other things you need to do. What does that mean about you? Well, it means I'm a bad mom, right? What kind of mom wouldn't want to spend time with their kids? What kind of mom wouldn't help their kids with their homework when she first got home? What's wrong with me? So there's ideas that there's something wrong with me more globally and then in a more localized way, I'm a bad mother, which seems to be connected to this idea of there's something wrong with me and these kind of perfectionistic ideas and schemas. So there are ways to, uh, to break these kind of thoughts down. So there is a uh, focusing worksheet in, the, in our book, which uh, is basically just a way to help siphon. So we have the whole story of what happened, right? So I get home from work, uh, place is a mess, dinner isn't made, kids need help, my, husband, my husband's hungry. He's not cooking. He's hungry, but he's not cooking. That's interesting. That's something to note, but there's all these different pieces there. 
Um, and then we want to look at, as we're mapping these different pieces out, what's the most upsetting part? And we could, we could look at this also based on what's the part that was the behavior we wanted to change or what's the part where you could have been more skillful but weren't. So if, it depends on what you're prioritizing, right? If we're prioritizing emotional change, then we're looking for what's the most upsetting part. If we're prioritizing behavior change, then we might be looking at, well, where's the place where the behavior wasn't what we wanted it to be? But if we can figure out what's the most upsetting part, then we can we can look at we can do that part right now. We can kind of three column thought record that section. So what were your different thoughts about that, and what was the feelings that went with this? Now for me, it helps to map this out because I tend to have people who might tell me thoughts that sound very depressing, but the feeling they tell me is anger and frustration. And so as we map it out, there's a chance for me to say, well, you know, if I had this thought that my husband doesn't love me enough to help out, I might not be mad. I might be really sad. I might be really depressed. Is it possible some of that was going on for you? Yeah, I think, I think so too. I think that makes total sense as a human. But we're trying to map it out. We're trying to see what are, what are we missing? Because sometimes there's thoughts that are not articulated. Sometimes there's thoughts that are images that we don't ask for because we've got other thoughts. And so Anxiety. Well, anxiety is usually kind of an image or a prediction. So, was there something you were afraid was going to happen? Were you afraid, right? If she, if the, if there was a really strong fear response, well, what were you afraid was going to happen? I was afraid my kids were going to fail and it'd be my fault, and they'd be failures. And down the line, I would know that I was just a bad mom and I failed them academically, which would be different than I feel sad because I because I um, I don't want to help my kids right now. I just want to get dinner done, sit down because I'm so tired. So what, which thought is most upsetting? So if you look at all the different thoughts, what's the most upsetting thought? So for Fiona coming home from work, the most upsetting thought was this idea that um, I should be helping my kids, but I'm not helping them. And what's the emotional meaning of that? Right? If that was true, hypothetically, if that was true that you should be helping your kids, but you're not, what would that mean? What's the emotional meaning of that? Well, it means I'm a bad mom. Okay, so now we're at now we're at something that's more underlying, more central. This is the opposite of that going after everything. We've now delved to find something really, really worth looking at. So I'm a bad mother. There's something wrong with me. These are two things we want to be focusing on. Uh, one strategy that I'm a really big fan of is uh, focusing on creating a shared definition. This is a strategy that we stole from James Overholzer, though he stole it from Socrates, so I don't feel as bad. But James also Overholzer wrote an excellent book as well, I think the Socratic method for psychotherapy, definitely worth getting. Um, so if you were at ABCT, when was that? So remember ABCT when Bob Leahy and Steve Hayes did uh, kind of they, they both saw the same client who had just been through a breakup and they you got to see kind of the the cbt version and then like the contextual cbt version so in that process the the, the client that bob was role playing with had this idea that uh, i had been through a breakup and no one will want to be with me and so uh, instead of bob being like well let's look at all your good qualities and talk about why you're so great bob said well what would you be looking for in a in a, in a partner made a list of what would you be looking for a partner and then said, well, how does this list fit you? Brilliant, right? Brilliant. This is the idea of creating a shared definition. So before jumping into the evaluation, trying to understand what are we going after? So, my, so Fiona has this idea I'm a bad mother. So instead of jumping into saying, well, what's the evidence you're a bad mother? What's the evidence you're not a bad mother? Which will be a lot of kind of like nitpicking where I'm like, well, I don't know if that really counts. I think that, I don't know if that's really, really evidence or what about this? It'll be easier if we can first have it uh, come up with something we both agree on beforehand and then see how it lines up. So this is one of those working smarter, not harder things. So we want to set some behavioral anchors. Right? We want to operationalize this. We want to figure out how we know if someone was a good mother, a uh, loser, and good person. These are other common ones that come up as well. Right? People think, well, if I fail, I'm a loser. Well, before we talk about you, let's talk about more in general before we get into this. So how would we know if someone was a good mother? So I might say to Fiona something like, well, Fiona, I want to look at this with you. But before we get into this, I want to see how do we know if someone is a good mother? How are we defining this? Because what 
what I know is that my definition is probably different than her definition, right? What I might say to my trainees is uh, distorted thoughts are often based on distorted definitions. So we want to work at the construct level. Now, here's the pro tip that I have. Um, so when you ask Fiona, so Fiona, how, what does it mean to be a good mother? Fiona is not going to say, oh, well, here's what it means like Webster's Dictionary. Fiona is currently in the emotions of feeling like she's a bad mother. And she's going to tell you that version. She's going to say, well, a good mother is someone who comes home. Their house is clean. There's always food for their kids. Um, you know, they're helping them with their homework. Everything's always clean and neat. And they spend time with them. And they love them. And they're happy. Now, we, now as we're listening, we go, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Fiona, it sounds to me like you're telling me why you think you're a bad mom right now. I know you beat yourself up a lot. You don't need to beat yourself up when you're with me. You do that enough when I'm not here. So not what do you not uh, why do you think you're a bad mother, but universal definition for everybody. How what's a fair definition for everyone that we can agree on of what it means to be a good mother? Um, so I, not all the time, but most of the time that happens for me with the people that I work with. You might not have that experience, but I have that all the time. So we, we'll talk about what does it mean to be a good mother? What I might do now with my people, just because it's telehealth and everything is kind of technology based, I might say, well, why don't we Google this together, right? If you want to pull up your phone, I'll pull up my phone. Or if we're on the share screen, let's type this in and let's Google what does it mean to be a good mother and see what we come up with and then see if we can kind of shape that definition. Um, of course, if you're doing, if you're having them look stuff up, it can be helpful to look it up together because you never know what they're going to find. But generally, there's enough like mental health advocate blogs that are out there that have good enough information that you'll get a definition that'd be more compassionate than her than her definition. So as we're talking about what does it mean to be a good mother, right? Then we can look to see, you know, it's, it's not just the things that, that she feels like she's the worst at, which is having the house clean, having dinner, dinner ready, helping your kids with their homework. But there's other things that are, go with being a parent that are pretty important, like loving your kids, uh, being, being there for them when it matters, right? That juggling the, the rubber balls versus the glass balls, knowing what you can drop and what you can't drop. These are pretty, pretty important parts of the process. So we're, we're talking through this as uh, definition, we're seeing what are the most important parts. Uh, so some of the most important parts were uh, loving her kids and her kids knowing that she loves them. Awesome. Okay, so now because we're uh, scientists, we want to know, well, is this an all or nothing thing or is this not an all or nothing thing? Because what we know from the literature is no one's a perfect mom. People might be like perfect moms on their Instagram account, but no one's really a perfect mom. So that's a setup, right? If, you, if it's all or nothing, we all fail. So we got to figure out what's the cutoff? How good is good enough? So these are questions to ask Fiona. So, so Fiona, if, if this is our list of what it means to be a good mom, how much do people need to do this to be qualified as a good mom? Do you need to do all of this all the time to be good? Do you need to do all of this most of the time or most of this all the time? What's the breakdown? Help me understand. And typically when I do this, I, I won't have clients say, oh, here's the, here's the benchmark. Usually they won't say, oh, 80%, 70%, because that would be indicative of like, uh, flexible thinking, right? Usually, it's more the, it's more in line with that all or nothing thinking. Well, let's say, well, I don't I don't really know. I've never thought about that, and it caught, it's a little bit of anxiety of like, what if, what if it's not the way I thought it was? Which is great. I'll take that anxiety, because um, then that means we can we kind of work with that. We can try and help them see that things are not what they might have thought they were. Cognitive flexibility. That's one of the goals. So we can talk about. Uh, where's the cutoff? And sometimes to make it easier to make a cutoff, we can try and draw a continuum. So Fiona, on this end, we have perfect mom of the year, Instagram, Pinterest mom. And what's, what's, what's the opposite of this? So what, what, what are the, the traits that would be not in keeping with being a good mother? And then can we, can we map this out? So I might then do A, B, C, D, F. Uh, and then we, with that idea, there's also the idea of if you're not where you want to be, that you don't have to stay there. Um, you know, a lot of times we get people who are coming into therapy when things aren't the best, right? Where they're not necessarily doing the best they've ever done in their life. Perhaps there's been some um, CPS involvement or child services involvement. And maybe a judge has told them you're an unfit mother. But there's a question of just because it's bad, does it always have to be that way? Is it, is it, if you're currently getting a D, 
or an F, do you always have to get this? Where have you been in the past? Where can you get back to? Cognitive flexibility. So this whole thing is, is we, we get some wiggle room now. So then later on, when we go to evaluate it, we already have some wiggle room. We've already worked in the direction of this. So in talking through this with Fiona, what does it mean to be a good mom? You know, this idea of like, well, I love my kids. Um, they know that I do my best, but I don't always have to be perfect, but that's scary to say that. Okay, cool. I, I can work with that. That's going to make it easier. Or if you have this idea of a client who thinks they're a failure, right? So if they think they're a failure, you know, we can have a conversation. Out, this is almost like a, a, a pre double standard or pre what would you tell a friend, right? So if someone fails, does that make them a failure? If someone fails and they keep trying, but then eventually succeed, does that mean they're still a failure? If someone succeeds and fails kind of half and half that make them a failure, what's, how are we defining this? And here we can try and get to a, a point where the idea is uh, failing is, is quitting uh, or quitting at some, or kind of quitting prematurely, but then we can also talk about quitting, but then quitting, you know, it's not gonna work and do something better could be good enough, but there's a lot of room, a lot of room for wiggle before we get into it. So it's a good strategy, right? But if you haven't seen that video of Bob and Steven doing that, it's such a good, such a good example. I'm a big fan of it. Um, so, but once we know what we wanna go after, then we wanna move into trying to see it from their point of view. This is the correct for that provided discovery. Cause it would be very easy for me to say, well, Fiona, let me show you uh, why you're a good mom. You know, let me just, let me, here's all these things you should know about yourself, dummy. She isn't going to work really well. Um, Long-term for change. Um, or if I focus on trying to say, well, let me show you what's, you, you're so worried about what's wrong with you. Let me show you what's right with you. It's, gonna, it's not going to, we're not going to, if you don't go through the emotion of, of the, their, their schema, it's going to be hard to get real change. So I'm trying to figure out, well, how have you come to believe this, right? I think people come by their beliefs honestly. How have you come by this honestly? How does this make perfect sense? I want to know what's it like to believe this, right? When you do this, how does that make you feel and what behaviors go with this? Right? Is there some way that there is a compensatory strategy that is shaping the system and creating a self-sustaining system? And I'm wrapping this in validation. I'm wrapping this in empathy. So here's a chance to, to soothe the client, to help them see, I want to understand you better. I'm going to see how this makes sense. Let me help you see how this is a totally normal thing for someone to arrive at based on what you've been through. And we can also later see what you might be missing. Uh, so phenomenological is a, um, people are like, what is that word? So phenomenological is a, philosophy term or humanistic psychology term, it means to understand something in subjective and objective terms. So it's not just rational, it's uh, emotional as well. And this is important for two reasons. One, we need to see how they see it, but also on the other side, the great lesson from emotion-focused therapy and um, all, all the emotional schema therapy and other things that are important part of CBT that have maybe always been a part of CBT, but are emphasized more one of the important things we found is that the emotional schema has to be activated for there to be change. So if we talk about this in a, in a sterile, purely rational way, and we don't get through the emotions of how you got here, then we're not going to activate that. And we're not going to be able to bring about changes in the structures. So we need to see it, but we also need them to access their feelings. We need to know what their feelings are. We need to access, access those feelings to move towards emotional transformation. Which is fun, right? We have a cool job. So there's some questions that we can ask ourselves to try and guide this process, right? So what experiences are this thought based on? All right, so if you think about Fiona with this idea of there's something wrong with me, what experiences are this based on? There were very clear times that her dad told her, clean it up. This is not okay. Not in our house. No one else is like this. Um, so that was kind of, ob uh, to her, actual evidence that there's something wrong with me. Um, facts that support this. People have actually told her this. Other facts that support this, she doesn't, she's never had a conversation with people where they've told her about their emotions. Part of that is because she has a lot of really superficial relationships because she's constantly reinventing herself, but she doesn't know the context, right? We can contextualize it later. Um, we want to ask ourselves if this was true, what would be the strongest evidence to support this? Now, I have been to trainings in the past where uh, trainers have said, don't worry so much about the evidence of why, why it might be true, really try and get to why it might not be true. 
Uh, and I am not that trainer. I'm not the person who's going to say that. So clinically, what my experience is, if the evidence is there, it's going to be there whether I talk about it or not. And if I don't acknowledge it, my client's going to think that I don't really know. And then they're going to think, well, yeah, in session, we said I was, I was good enough. But my therapist doesn't know. They don't know how I really am. If they knew how bad I really was, they wouldn't say that. So I want to know. I want to talk about it. I want to honor it. The idea is people are doing the best they can. They have. So let's, let's embrace this with, with empathy and validation and soothing. And let's really take, uh, let's mentally take a step back, eyes wide open, take an accounting of what's going on. So I'm asking myself, this, if this was true, right? If it was true that you were the only person that had emotions, how would we know that? What would that look like? It happens to not be true, but if it was true, what would that look like? If it was true that you were a bad mom, if it was true that you didn't love your kids, what would, what would be evidence of that? Is any of that going on? Um, and this also helps us focus on being really curious and the client seeing that we're really curious, not in a judgmental way, but in a help me understand the data kind of way. Is this something people have said directly to them in the past? What's it like to believe this? What's it like to think you're the only person with, with emotions? If you're like secretly in a world where no, no one has feelings, but you have feelings and you have to kind of hide that you have feelings and all your energy goes into masking that you have them. So you're so exhausted, you don't have time to really enjoy your life. That's good data. That's very good data to have. How long have they believed this? When, they, when do they believe this more or less is a great question that helps us understand in their life, what are the things that are shaping this? What are the things that are reinforcing this? What are the situations they're doing better in where maybe we want more of? What do they do when this comes up? And there's a chance for validation. Well, I, I, I see how you get here, right? We're trying to validate. If we're thinking uh, DBT skills, this is level four, or level five validations. So I, this, it's based on previous learning, it makes totally, totally makes sense how you got here. It totally makes sense theory. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I think there might be things you might be missing, but I see how you get it. I see how you learned this lesson from the childhood you had. Of course you learned, of course you learned that you were the only one who felt this way when your dad told you that. that. Of course you think you're a bad mom when you come home and you're exhausted and your kids want uh, you to do something you, you can't do then. And then it's hard for them to understand in the moment why that is. And you have this underlying idea that there's something wrong with you. I don't see you arriving at a thought other than that initially. I want to help you get there, right? but I totally see how you get there. For me, what I'm trying to do in this process is I'm trying to mentally conceptualize the belief in this way. So I'm trying to think through, here's the belief that my client has. What automatic thought or prediction is that making them have? What does that make them do? How does that shape the environment? And how are, what's their schematic filtering that maintains the belief? Right, so, I, so my client has this idea that I'm the only one who has depression, there's something wrong with me. Uh, if, she, if she feels bad, but she has the idea, if I tell people I'm feeling bad, they're gonna reject me, they're gonna judge me, they're gonna shame me. So I'm gonna mask. And what happens when you do masking? People, people, don't, uh, people aren't able to validate your emotion. They're not, you're not able to connect with them. Also, your relationships end up being uh, strained because it's hard to emotionally connect to someone who's not emotionally connected to themselves, somebody who's not emotionally authentic, which she doesn't interpret this as, oh, I'm, I'm not really in touch with myself. It's hard for me to connect with other people. She says, there must be something really, really wrong with me. Because remember, uh, schematically, people twist the evidence to fit their expectations. So I'm trying to map out, what do you think is going to happen? What do you do? How is that shaping what happens? Because ultimately, I want to get them to, I want to change in behavior, right? It'll be a lot easier to change the belief structure if we can change the system that's maintaining the belief structure. We're trying to develop uh, understanding. There's a, a lot of things that we can look at for developing understanding. So we're trying to see what led to this. What's the current evidence? Uh, what are your perceptual filters? How are you twisting the evidence? What's the emotional meaning of those factors? Can we process that emotional meaning? And what are the behaviors you're doing that are reinforcing this together? Here's what I'm trying, because once I know what's the basis, then I can see, well, where do I have some wiggle room? Where could I put a little bit of weight and try and shift the table? So once we see it from their point of view, right? So this idea that uh, I'm something wrong with me, I'm a bad mother, then we want to try and expand that together. So we're looking to expand this with collaborative curiosity. Curiosity is really the key to this whole process. And collaboration is this idea of we're trying side by side to work with them. The mental images we're sitting together, looking at something, trying to figure it out. So we're trying to figure out what are they missing? What are they not saying? 
So I, um, so initially I wasn't a CBT therapist, right? Initially I was psychodynamically trained and my psychodynamic supervisor would say to me, now, Scott, is this a blind spot or a dumb spot? I never knew what she meant at the time. I always kind of thought she was calling me stupid. So I never said anything because I was like, that was my compensatory strategy was, well, if someone calling me stupid is a uh, uh, schema inconsistent. I'm going to avoid this situation. Um, it wasn't until later that I said, hey, so you say this. I don't know what this means. And she was able to say, well, I want to know, like, do you not see this or do you not know this? I was like, well, why didn't you say that to me? Because I, I definitely probably would have gotten better supervision if I would have been uh, just more honest with her. Been like, what are you saying? So what is the, So once we see it from their point of view, then we can try and figure out what are the things that they know but they don't remember or they're not paying attention to. Right? So mood dependent memories, schematic filtering, things they're missing, and what are things that they don't know? What was the absence of experience? Right. So Fiona has things she's doing well, but she's not paying attention to them because she's twisting. But then she has things that she's never experienced, right? She's never talked with people about her feelings or emotions. Telling me, her therapist, that she had depression was terrifying to her. So I know that she wasn't telling other people who weren't therapists these things. So what do they not know? What do they not see? And then we're looking also at questions of implications, pervasiveness, permanence, universality, exceptions, double standards. I dislike that sentence. I feel like that's just a lot of fun words. But we're looking to see how are they overgeneralizing? How are they, if we think about like your research skills, right? How are they um, taking a, a, something that happened and then extrapolating that to, to beyond the context that it happened in, in a way that it is no longer a valid conclusion? So what are they missing? How are they overgeneralizing? Um, some more Instagram graphics. This is just a nice graphic, right? So once we see it from their point of view, we want to expand that point of view together with curiosity. Uh, a meme. Uh, Jason, if you talk to Jason, Jason says, "Let's tell you, Scott makes memes that aren't very good, but he likes them." So, uh, so I, we did a. Uh, if we had more time, I would talk about this uh, research study I did where we looked at thought records, because uh, similar question, right? So we were saying, "Why are there so many thought records, right?" The, uh, why are there so many thought records? Why are they so different? Does it matter which one people use when we're teaching them? And so we did a, a research study where we solicited thought records from people who were trainers, people who were authors. We looked at all the books we could find. We found like 114 unique thought records that were different from each other. And that was wild to us because previously I would have thought, well, you got the three column, the five column, the seven column, the ABC worksheet, and the cognitive distortion one. Um, but there was actually so much more diversity than that. So then we created a coding system, and uh, in our coding system, we looked at kind of is the function of the thought record to teach the model or apply the model? If it's to apply the model, are they applying it through rational responding or reframing? So this is kind of Gen 1 uh, CBT. Are they doing it through cognitive distortions? So um, Burns in the Feel Good Handbook was the first person to add cognitive distortions to the thought record, looking at, well, here's what you're thinking. Is, is your thinking distorted? Is there another way of looking at it's not distorted? And then looking to evaluate the thought together. Uh, so I'm a fan of the latter. So quick story, just because we have a, uh, I'm going to fit it in. It's, it's, I like the story anyways, I'm going to tell it. So Christine Podesky, brilliant, right? So she invented the seven column thought record in 1984. It's in the mind of her mood text. And I love the story of how she arrived at it. I think it is a good illustration of uh, CBT thinking. So what she found was that in session, her clients were really good at thought records. Like they did it together. It worked well. They, they got good change. On their own, it was really hard for them to do thought records. They had a hard time arriving at new thoughts that were balanced. They had a hard time figuring it out. And so Christine, brilliant mind, says, well, let's study this. Let's try and understand what is it about the, them with me that's different than them without me. I love that. And what she found was that with her, they were evaluating what's the evidence is true and not true. But they weren't doing that on their own because there wasn't a space for it on the thought record. So she said, well, let's just add two more columns. Let's just add a column for what the evidence might be true and the evidence might not be true. And then they can do it on their own. Isn't ah, brilliant. I love that so much. So uh, we're looking to, so the idea is, is we're trying to use a, a Socratic approach. So, so if, the, if you're looking at reframing distortions, evaluating it together, evaluating it together is going to be the most Socratic approach, right? Showing them, showing that someone that their thought is distorted by pointing out they're wrong is going to be different than trying to help them join with us to see the new perspective, which is not to say ignore distortions. The way that I approach distortions is I mentally note them and then that'll come up in the evaluation, right? So if I think that someone is overgeneralizing, in my evaluation, we can look and see, well, is this always the case? If I think someone is catastrophizing or um, 
uh, future, I want to say future tripping, but that's not the word. Crystal balling. There's so there's so many lists because of copyright reasons. There's all these different lists, and I know all the lists, and it makes it confusing. But if we think someone is predicting something they can't know, well, how do they know this is going to happen? If we think someone is magnifying or minimizing, we can look to see is that happening, and it, it can come out in the evaluation. If someone has a go-to distortion, I might teach them about it. But usually, it's very rare for me to sit down with a client and say, "Here's the list of distortions. Don't do this," because I find that that just doesn't work as well for me with my folks. So I know some clients really like it, though. So you got to balance it. So collaborative curiosity. So this is functionally the disconfirming evidence step. So here is where we're looking to see um, how, what are we missing? If you think about the seven column thought record, evidence might be true, evidence might not be true, but it's more than just a disconfirming evidence because we're looking to see now that we see it from their point of view, what are they missing? So what's the missing evidence? What are the missing experiences? Once we conceptualize the behaviors that go with this, we know what your avoidance and control strategies are. What are, what are what's the evidence that would exist that you don't have? All right, so things you don't know, things you don't see. What are the gaps? So for Fiona, what were some of the things that she didn't know? And what were some of the things that she didn't see? So some of the things that she didn't know on the there's something wrong with me part was that other people have emotions. All right, so as we're talking about this, there's a chance for me to say to Fiona, well, so it seems like you've never really talked with people about this, right? It seems like you've, you've never really told people. I know you, it was hard for you to tell me that you're depressed. Have you ever talked with people about their feelings as well? She's like, no, I've never, never done that. I just assume that no one else feels this way. Okay, well, do you, do you think other people might have, might have feelings? Or do, you think, or do you think that this thought that you're the only one is, is true? How could we test this out? Right? We, we, we've never really known. I, I don't know. I've never even thought about that. Okay, well, let's start small. Uh, what about me? So I'm a human. Um, I don't know if I count or not, but do you want to, do you want to ask me if I have feelings as well? And she's like, whoa, hold on. Uh, I guess. Okay. All right. She has to ask me. So, okay. So, so ask me. So Dr. Waltman, do you, do you have feelings? Do you have emotions? Yeah, I have all the feelings. I, have, I get sad. I get angry. I get depressed. I get jealous. I get bored. And the whole human experience is what I have. She's like, wild. This is like I told her I'm Santa Claus. Like, wild. How did this happen? This is crazy. But then she has me to say, well, maybe, maybe it's just me, though, right? Maybe we're the only two. So how would we know if it was more than just us? Well, why don't we look this up, right? Why don't we, let's uh, hop back on the internet and let's Google um, prevalence rates for depression. Let's Google, uh, let's look at blogs uh, for people who are mental health, mental health advocates. Let's look at, I think, hashtags like depression warrior, anxiety warrior, things like that. So we're looking things up together and she's like, this is crazy. This is crazy. I can't believe that there's other people who have this. Um, but then also like shame is lifting. I'm not the only one, right? Ooh, I almost, I almost connected with the, the emotion of it. I was going to start crying because it was such, it was really, really, really beautiful when it happened. But so she's connecting with that. I'm not the only one. But then there's a chance, but we want to keep building on her because I don't want her just to have just a private experience and know she's not the only one. I want her to connect with people in her life. So who are people? So maybe you and I, and maybe the internet, but the internet might not be real. Uh, people in your life are the people that you can talk with them about what's going on for you and also about what might, might be going on for them. She's like, yeah, I think I need to do that, but I'm really afraid to do that. Okay, so let's so let's set you up for success, right? The first time you do something usually doesn't go great because you're not good at it yet. So let's figure out where's the smartest place to start. She's like, well, my sister just got out of the hospital. She's been hospitalized a few times for depression over the years. I guess I could talk with her. And I'm like, what? What? The, how, how is that not evidence? But okay, okay. So your sister has been struggling with depression for a while, and you. You might talk with her about her depression and your depression. That sounds like a great conversation to have. So when are you going to see her? Well, I'm going to go see her this weekend. Okay, so let's 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 role play. Let's talk it out. Let's problem solve. Let's think about what might what might go wrong. And now she's going to gather new evidence. So it's not just evidence that supports this evidence that doesn't support this, but it's what's the evidence that we might be missing? How can we go gather new evidence? Which is exciting. So she goes and does it. She comes back. And I am just like, this is my favorite thing as a therapist. We're learning. You're doing stuff. This is, I did all that work at the beginning to get here. This is the good stuff. So she comes in. She's like, Dr. Walman, you're not going to believe it. I'm like, okay, tell me, tell me what happened. And she's like, well, I told my sister about my depression. She goes, yeah, the whole family struggles with depression. And I go, what? I thought you were the only one. She goes, yeah, me too. 
I thought I was the only one, but apparently everyone has it. Uh, my sister has been hospitalized a few times for it. And uh, I was telling, telling my sister about it. And she says, well, yeah, I mean, dad's been going to the VA for a few decades to be treated for PTSD. We all have problems because of it. And I'm like, what? Your dad who told you it's not okay to have feelings, who told you it's not okay to have emotions, has been dealing with it on his own? Like, this is information. This is context. Now that we have context, we can re-explore the previous things that happened in light of the context to see how might we have extrapolated beyond what makes sense, right? How might we have overgeneralized beyond what makes sense? Right, so what, what does that mean to you, right? So you had this idea that you were the only one, but you're not. Um, what is, how do you make sense of that? What does that mean to you? So I'm not trying to tell her like, look, we're right. I'm trying to say like, this is really interesting. Here's a discrepancy. What do you make of this discrepancy? The chance for her to say, well, I guess I'm not the only one, which is like confusing, but like nice, but confusing, but cool. We can work with that. So that was, a, that was really, really exciting. Uh, this idea that I'm a bad mother, right? So one of the uh, thoughts that she had that was driving that was this idea where she loved her kids, but she didn't always want to be around them because she was tired. If anyone has kids, they can you, you can say that I love these kids, but I don't always want to be around them. And that's okay. But she didn't know that was okay. So she had this idea of, I think I love my kids, but I don't always want to be around them. And sometimes I just want them to go away. And sometimes it'd be easier if I didn't have them, which is a normal human thought to have. But she didn't know this because she didn't talk with anyone about these things. So I said, well, let's, uh, well, I'm not a mom myself, so I can't speak to the mom experience, but uh, I can help you look this up. Let's Google this. So we Googled the, the phrase, uh, I love my kids, but I don't always like them. And like millions of results came up and she was like, this is crazy. Because it, it felt like sacrilege to her to be looking these things up. Um, but we looked it up and then millions of people and we're reading these mommy blogs together. And she's like, this is crazy. This, look at this. But she's seeing uh, for herself that I'm not the only one who, who feels this way. Right? We're, we're gathering new evidence. We're able to then talk about, well, you love your husband, but you don't always want, want to be around him. Oh, absolutely. I and mean, that's, that's okay though. Yeah. So why is this different? And then we're trying, and we're touching into perfectionism, all or nothing thinking, things like that. It's just exciting work once we get here, right? Once we start moving it along. So what do they what do they not see? What's the evidence they might be missing? I'm really focused on kind of two two parts with this. So I'm looking to see what's the missing evidence, right? What's the evidence you don't have because of your avoidance? How can we go gather it? And I'm also really focused on how can we contextualize the previous evidence? Because a lot of times, uh, if we understand how the mind works, right? So the mind tends to twist things where people will see things in light of how they expect to see them. So there's going to be previous evidence that doesn't support the belief, but they're going to twist it so it does support their beliefs. So we're looking to help them see how, how might you be mis, uh, misinterpreting what happened. Not because you're doing this deliberately, but it's just how the brain works. So uh, some of the good evidence before, so dad was really emotionally avoidant and really afraid of emotions didn't want you to be emotional later you learned that dad had ptsd has been treatment for a while well let's talk about that let's 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 try and reinterpret your early experiences with dad in light of the idea that he's been struggling with ptsd for a while how does this now make sense now well things that we found was well maybe a lot of this wasn't about emotions being wrong maybe a lot of this was about he was uncomfortable with emotions. He was uncomfortable with my emotions. My emotions made him emotional and he wanted that to go away because he was, he was struggling. He was doing the best he could, which is a very different narrative, right? It's a very different narrative to say, growing up, I wasn't allowed to be emotional because my dad had, had challenges he was dealing with. And it, it, if I was emotional, it made it hard for him. So I had to try and minimize it. Very different than growing up. I had feelings I was the only one. It was a dirty, dirty secret. So she's able to see that new context, you know, what are we missing? Then we can help her see things in a more three-dimensional way. Uh, we're asking ourselves questions like, if this wasn't true, what would be the indications of that, right? So these are some of the questions I had, right, in my head. So if you weren't the only mom who didn't always want to be around your, your kids, how would we know that? Well, probably other moms would say that. Where might they say that? How can we access this? Who can we talk to about this? Can we look for evidence? All right, if you weren't the only one with emotions, who else would have emotions? Where can we find them? How can we learn this? How can we test this out? Uh, we might need to look on uh, time orientation, right? So if people are at a particularly dark spot in their life, is it always going to be this way? Can, can things change? If the evidence currently supports their belief, does it always have to support their belief? There's a lot of questions that they can ask themselves. Um, so we're trying to pull it together. Um, we had context to mitigate the effects. If we had been in this situation, what would we think would happen? 
Are there exceptions or discrepancies? What are the facts? What would they tell a friend? What might a friend tell them? Has it always been this way? Can we go and gather new evidence? So, so once we do the hard work of trying to understand it, trying to see where they're coming from, this is where it's now easier, where we can say, well, what might we be missing? How can we go gather new evidence? And usually people are more willing to do this if they've seen that in earnest, we've been trying to understand it. If they don't think that we have an agenda and we're trying to prove them wrong, but, but we're, we, we honestly want to understand this, we honestly want to understand them, then, the, then they'll join with us in this process. So let me talk a little bit about summary and synthesis, and then we'll move into a break. I, I know how therapists are. We all have 55-minute uh, sessions, and we probably have 55-minute bladders. So we're moving. We're, we're, getting, we're getting real close to taking a break. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll do some Q&A right after the break. So, uh, so summary and synthesis. So this is an important step. So oftentimes, kind of a minor finding in the study was people might stop after this step, because usually when you do collaborative curiosity, the client feels better, right? There's some emotional catharsis from the idea that maybe what I think isn't true. But we want people more than just to feel better, we want them to do better. We want them to change what they're doing, we want them to make steps. So the idea of summary and synthesis is consolidation of learning and then pointing that in direction of doing something different behaviorally. So how does this all fit together? Not just the good, but the whole, the whole picture, right? We, I don't want a, a really positive thought. I want a really accurate, balanced, helpful thought. How do they make sense of this? And how can we balance it out? So balance is key. Um, this is an image. I used to have an image of me hiking around uh, Red Rocks of uh, the Southwest. For some reason, I changed it to this. This is one of those images that's like a, you can use it if you give attribution. So it's like the, the peak. The idea is this, right? So if you go on a hike and you get to the top of it, you don't get to the top, take a picture, post it, and climb back down. That wouldn't be, you're not really living, right? That's just, you're going up there just to like get it done and post it. If you take a long hike and you get up there, what do you do? You, you, you see if you can sit down, you really drink it in. You say, like, I worked hard to get here. I want to I really enjoy this. And that's what we do as therapists once we reach this point, right? Once I, I did that hard work of identifying the thoughts, seeing how this makes sense, seeing what you might be missing, I'm going to be belaboring this, right? This is like um, if you if this, the people who went to Europe once, like five years ago, and keep posting the picture on Instagram over and over and over again. So like, I'm really, I'm, I'm getting my money's worth out of this. So I am really belaboring this. I'm not moving on too fast. I am... Um, once we get there, I'm talking uh, these ideas. Well, I thought I was the only one, but I'm not the only one. I'm saying, wow, okay, that's so interesting. So tell me more about that. And that, as they're saying that, I'm saying that I'm saying it to myself out loud, and then I'm saying it to them, and then I'm saying it back to myself out loud. I'm writing it down. As I'm writing it down, I'm saying it out loud. I'm reading it back after I write it down. And I'm just kind of repeating it over and over again. I'm writing it down. I'm saying, I'm going to bring this up. Next time we talk about something, I'm going to remind you of this. It sounds like such an important point. And then the next session, I'm going to bring it up again. I'm going to use this in future dialogues. And just, I'm going to, this is not high rotation. Uh, it's, it's, you might as well, might as well really just belabor it and savor it. So summary is essentially how do we fit it together? So we're looking for a balanced summary. Um, if you ask the client, can we summarize the whole picture? I would say, it's really unusual for a client to really be able to summarize the whole thing really well on their own because it's kind of emotionally laden. So I might do a big summary and ask them to summarize my summary. And that seems to be more doable for them. Or try and summarize each side of it. So summarize how does this make sense? Summarize what did we learn? Evidence that supports this, evidence that doesn't support this. Um, and then what's this new perspective? Is this new thought believable? Sometimes people tell us very positive thoughts that they don't necessarily believe. And so do you actually believe this? Uh, can, we, can we make, what would it take to make that more believable? Is there a more believable version of that? And then synthesis is, is kind of side by side. How do you, how do these compare? So initially you said, you, I'm the only one who feels this way. And now you're saying, actually, a lot of people have depression. How do you make sense of that? How do you reconcile the two? Right. Initially you said, I'm a bad mom, but now you're saying, I'm a good enough mom doing my best. How do you fit these two together? How do you reconcile that? And it's, it's a deliberate question that doesn't make sense because I want them to have that backwards air propagation learning. I want them to have that, oh, I guess that doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah, huh. I guess they don't fit. Interesting. Okay, well, tell me about that. Why, why not? Well, I think before I thought I had to be perfect, but I don't. Oh my God, say that again. I got to write that down. That was so good. I think before I had to be perfect, but I'm not. I think before I had to be perfect, but I'm not. 
wow, do you believe that? Is that true? I think I had to be perfect, but I'm, I think before I had to be perfect, but I'm not. I don't have to be perfect. Wow. Okay. So what are we going to do about that? What changes would you make in your week if that was true? What, what, how can we put that into behavior? And if we can put that into behavior and we can test that out, then we're going to go gather new evidence. If we gather new evidence, we can keep working out this belief. So it becomes a, a, a cycle of gathering new evidence, having new information to, to revisit the dialogue, gathering new information, kind of cognitive and behavioral working together one step at a time. So this is probably a good uh, breaking point. I know we're supposed to take a 15 minute break on the front end and a 15 minute break on the back end. So why don't we take a, a coffee break and a bathroom break and then we'll come back and we'll do uh, more uh, Q&A. So we have some, some Q&A, right? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Oh, I like it. Should I take the slides down for this or? No, you can leave them up, I think. You might. Unless want you want your face really them. big. Uh, I mean, I feel like my face is like, it's, not, it's okay, right? It's not like, it's not my selling point usually, but uh, <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it down. It'll be fine. Easy enough. I'm like a Zoom expert at this point. All right, cool. So what are our questions? Okay, right. so, um, oh, I'll, I'll just jump in with one quickly that applied to, I think, the one of the last things that you were saying before the break. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, great job so far. This is super interesting. We've got a lot of really positive feedback. So oh, thanks, thank you. Lindsay. You're so hard. nice. You can't see any of our faces or, you know, our excitement mm. when you talk. So just giving you that feedback. Mm. Um, okay. So one person had the question, how would, how would you, what would you do when a client says that this doesn't apply to them, just to me? Like, so for example, if you do the Google search, you get all mm. the evidence, they might say, well, that's okay for them. But when I don't want to be with my kids, I'm a bad mom. They're not, mm. but I am. I love that question. That's so good. Right. So, so you're, you're probably going to see that, right? So maybe see that a lot. This idea of like, there's a different standard for me than for other people. So the, the strategy would be to, to kind of focus on that. So instead of trying to, because what I don't want to do is I don't want to evaluate a thought based on like an unfair definition, because that's, we're going to arrive, we're going to essentially prove their, their, their thought true if, if the definition is skewed. So if they're saying to me something like, well, yeah, other, other moms, it's okay for them, but not for me. I want to know why. Help me understand what that is. And we might kind of zero in on this. And then I'm looking to see, was this 100%? Is there some wiggle room? Do you believe this more times than other times? For them, why is it okay for them? And trying to map that out. And how does that apply back to them? But probably probably there's some, there's some kind of thought or assumption underneath that, right? So I might look at... Um, from a, a conceptual perspective, I'm trying to figure out, well, what, why is this scary for them? Why is this hard for them? What's, what's the fear driving this? So hypothetically, if you, were, if you were to give yourself some grace, right? Hypothetically, if you had some compassion with yourself, why is that scary, unacceptable, bad? What, what, what happens next? Is this, is this a fear thing? Is this a control thing? So essentially, I'm saying a lot, but I'd be really, really curious about it. I, would, I wouldn't be like surprised that I came across it because that's how people function is they have these mental gymnastics they do, but I'd be really, really curious about it. And I would slow down, right? I wouldn't say, well, we got 30 minutes left. We have to finish the worksheet. Let's move along. I'd say, well, let's, let's slow down. Let's really explore this together. Great. Um, let's see. We have another question of how do you resolve the apparent contradiction between teaching skills, mm -hmm. which implies an expert who gives information, with the process of discovering together? For example, yeah. patients expect, uh, due to CBTPR, that they will be given um, tools. So how do you recognize and handle the patient expectation? Mm -hmm. I love that question. You guys have a good group. Okay, cool. So if I understand it correctly, it sounds like we're saying there's this dilemma, right? Where we're saying, hey, look, we're working together, you know, we're collaborating. And at the other time, they're paying me money because I'm an expert and they're coming in because they need help working on stuff. And they're saying, like, please help me. So I like that. So I remember um, I was saying, my, I was talking about my psychodynamic background before. I remember in supervision first year, uh, on one of the tapes, one of my colleagues said to the client something like, you're the expert here, whatever you say, we're going to do that. And my supervisor was like, never say that again. What are you doing? This is bananas. Of course, I'm not like that far into it. But the, 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 the nuance is usually, you know, we're the expert on CBT, right? We're the expert on the science. We're the expert on mental health. We're the expert on what, what works. We're not the expert on their experience. We're not the expert on what their life is like. We're not 
although I have a very good idea what depression is, I don't necessarily know what depression is like for them until they help me understand what it is. Right? I don't, I know what rain is, but I don't know what rain feels like on your skin. So, so the idea is that we have to say like, we both have expertise, but like you need me and I need you. I can't do this without you. You could do this without me, but it would be harder. it will be easier to have me. So that's how I work to reconcile it, but it is, it, it, I can see how you say, Scott, are you talking about both sides of your mouth here? What's going on? Thank you. Um, so we had a couple of also more technical questions regarding the focusing worksheet. Um, people were asking, is it meant to be done by yourself as the therapist to prepare for the collaborative session, or do you do it in session with the patient, or do you, is it more of a clinical call? I love these questions. They're so good. Okay. I like it. So often, so typically if I'm doing a worksheet, I'm doing it together in session with the client and I'm talking about, here's what I'm doing. Here's why I'm doing it. I'm very transparent, which is my favorite thing about CBT. I don't have to have a poker face, which is good because as you might guess, I'm very bad at poker because people always know when not to bid and when to bid because I'm always like, I have a good hand. And they're like, we fold. Um, so it's easy for me to be able to say like, okay, so this is, is a lot going on. I'm trying to understand it. If we, if we can stay organized, I can understand you better. So this, if I, if I say this, this is going to help me understand you better, not like this is the worksheet you have to do is because this is what therapy is, but this is a tool to help me understand you. The client wants us to understand them, right? Usually people come into therapy because they feel misunderstood because other people in their, in their life haven't been emotionally present with them or don't have the emotional stamina, stamina to sit through the rumination with them and help them get out of that. So typically I'm walking them through it. Um, if I have a work, if we're in person, I might put this on the table by them. I have a copy for them. If, um, if, if we're on tele, I can put it on the share screen or I can email it to them. It's always harder, right? I, I, there's a lot of worksheets that I, I made into Excel tables instead of PDFs, because for whatever reason, PDFs, when I'm entering them, use a lot of memory, but I mean, it kind of slows down my video chat software. Maybe I'm the only one, but so I do that in Excel. That I, I might be just me, I'm, I'm like a geriatric millennial where I'm not quite young, but I'm not quite like, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird demographic to be in. So I'm technologically savvy mostly. I, I, I feel like I answered different questions than you asked on that though. Um, let's see. So there's a, there's another question about uh, the person wrote, would love to hear an example of doing this work when it involves a moralistic concern. Um, and the person listed an example, um, I am a slut, for example. Okay. Oh, interesting. I thought, I, th I thought they were going to lean into, I'm a bad mother, but there had to be like instances of, of abuse or something like that. But, you're, but we're saying like, so if someone thinks like I'm a slut, uh, so I guess, I guess kind of slut shaming themselves or applying these kind of moralistic ideas about sexual um, promiscuity, uh, freedom, ideas, kind of should ideas, should values. So if, if someone had that, so the first thing I would do is I would, I would walk gently with them through the process, but I would, I would say, well, this idea of like, you're a slut, what, what does this mean? Where does this come from? What does it mean to you to be a slut? Where did you come across this term? What's your background that shapes these views? Who, you know, whose other views have shaped this? Are my views the same as yours? And then once we get there, then there's also kind of this corollary of kind of like, so what, right? So theoretically, if the idea of slut does exist, which I'm not sure that it does, but theoretically, this idea of slut does exist. And if you meet that definition, like what, what about that? You think you're, you think you're bad. You think you're immoral. You think you're, you're somehow going to be, have less valuable, you, you'll be less valuable to someone else because your purpose in life is to bring value to someone by, with your purity or what's, what's, what's the idea underneath this? Because that's probably what I really want to work on. Um, that's probably where the real heart of it is. But I, I would still try and have a, a, a matter of fact, curious conversation about it. In a way, in a way where if, if the thing that I'm trying to really convey all the time to so my clients is like, I'm just really curious, help me understand this, help me see where you're coming from. And when they see that genuine curiosity, they're like, oh, no one ever talks about this. This is weird. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'm game. Let's do this. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question. Do you ever use the uh, schema questionnaire to incorporate into the CBT work? Um, I have. Um, you certainly could. I mean, I think the idea is, is you want to pull in whatever you think is going to be relevant for your person. So I know there are, there's a lot of inventories and questions looking to see what people's schemas, beliefs, thoughts might be. And if you have something that you think is where they might be, you certainly could pull it in and that's, that's fine. I mean, the idea of um, trying to make something like that. So if you're saying, so Scott Socratic questioning, you're asking questions, it's all very inductive. 
if you're leading with something that maybe you're kind of suggesting something is that counter collaboration, which is similar to the idea of like, if you have a good reframe, but sometimes you have a really, really good reframe. Um, like, what do you do? One, you could try and inhibit and see if you see if you arrive there on their own and that's good. Sometimes you don't want to, that's okay, but there's ways to frame it um, more of a hypothesis. There's ways to say like, these are labels. Some people find these to be helpful. Of course, this, is, this doesn't capture the totality of human experience. You know, I know um, a lot of times people will kind of hand their client like a list of like core beliefs and be like, well, which one of these do you think are going on for you? And that seems to work well for them. I tend to not do that myself um, because uh, I, I think when people kind of interpret those in light of how they're feeling and they tend to feel bad about themselves, and they tend to kind of glom onto a few and it tends to not be as valuable. So I, I like to be more inductive, but largely because I think it's more interesting for people that way, right? I think I mean, similar to like if you're working with like worry, you're trying to move people towards productive problem solving, you could very quickly say, the problem is, is you're a ruminator, you're worried things aren't gonna happen. Let's help you start uh, problem solving instead of worrying, uh, which, is, which is true. Uh, but that's not gonna work as well as if you walk through it with them. If you say, well, let's study your worries. Let's look at the categories. Oh, this is really interesting. Okay, let's sort these. You know, I'm noticing a pattern. I'm noticing a pattern. You're spending a lot of time thinking about things you can't do anything about. Fascinating, huh? How is it for you, right? Is that exhausting for you to spend all of your energy on things you can't do anything about and there's not energy to do things you really care about? And there's a chance to say, oh, I wonder what we could do about this, huh? I have an idea, let's try this out. And then for them, they're like, yes, my th I'm having like this, like uh, my personal chef experience and people, people like that. So that's, that's the way I do it, but it's not the only way, right? You have to, you have to do CBT that fits your style. Great. Um, what about, and this one, I think we've all come across, um, mm -hmm. how do you deal with a client saying, I believe this new thought that we arrived at, but I just don't feel it. Yes. I love that. You see that all the time. All, I would definitely expect to see that. So second half, when we're talking about core belief stuff, we'll be focusing more on that. But generally, if someone is saying intellectually, I know I'm a good person, but emotionally, I feel like I'm not a good person. What I'm going to assume is that they've only kind of processed that like above their ears, right? They've only kind of intellectually talked about it and thought about it. They haven't actually walked through the emotion of it. So I would be trying to see, well, first I would be trying to map out for them because we've we got to emotionally process it. So I'd be trying to map out for them. So what are the parts that feel like, even if you don't intellectually think it's true, like what part feels like it's true? I'm trying to get into that, trying to find experiences where this might have happened to try and process those, maybe rescript, but process those situations. Um, but ultimately what, what, what we know, the basic, the, you know, we talk about the triangle, right? Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are interrelated. Uh, but it's not really like you do one and it all changes. Usually the emotion changes last, right? So if I intellectually, I know this is true, but, emo but emotionally, it feels like it's not true. What are the behaviors that, how can we reshape your life? Because if you're, if you're in a really shitty relationship and you feel like you're not good enough, a good way to, to make it so you feel better is not just like uh, changing, reevaluating your thoughts about yourself, but leaving the situation that's caused, that's, that's triggering this and, and that's causing you to have more evidence that you feel like you're not good enough. So, so environmental change. This is a sort of similar add-on question where it's not as much about mm -hmm. feeling and believing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, really like emotionally feeling the thought, but just mm -hmm. sort of a the yes but patient who's oh, like the yeah. rebuttal. Yeah, yeah. So this person asked, um, mm -hmm. I've I have someone I tried Socratic dialogue with who believes 100% he's a bad person. He believes mm -hmm. that since he did X Y Z, that means he's bad. Mm -hmm. When we uncovered positive data, for example, he has empathy, good things he's done for others. He responded yes, but a serial killer could do those things too. Mm -hmm. That's true, right? Dex, Dexter Morgan was very nice in, in the yeah. show, but he was kind of that like dark hero, right? It's kind of interesting. So in that, anytime I run into the yes spot, right, that's a good signal for me that like I'm in provided discovery mode. I'm trying to show the client the wrong mode. Uh, I might be right, but like they're not, they're not getting it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slow, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to focus on trying to come back to understanding, validation, not trying to say like, tell me why you're, tell me why you're, you're right and I'm wrong, but I'm trying to say, well, I think I might be missing something, right? It sounds to me like it feels to you like I'm pushing this. My goal isn't to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong because that's not what therapy is, right? My goal is to understand you and then to help both of us understand what you might be missing. But the, the, the questions there, right? if we're thinking kind of like, um, like a moral injury is just kind of what, what you're in the realm of there. Or then we're looking to see you know, how, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be good? Is there a path towards redemption? Uh, 
because there, there probably is some, well, there could be some kind of transgression of sorts that happens they might need to process. And maybe it's helpful to involve spiritual care if they're, I'm in Texas where everyone's very, very religious. You're up in New York where people might be kind of religious in a different way. And you have to kind of work within the context of the person's life. Um, but I would be, I would take that as a signal that, you know what, I'm really pushing this. So there is, um, so the, the trial-based CBT guy, I can never, uh, I can never remember his name. I know all the letters, but I always mess it up. Uh, but he has, a, he calls the sentence reversion, sentence uh, reversion based thought record where you take the, the yeah, but and you switch it around, right? So yeah, I've done these good things, but it doesn't count as serial killer could do this. But then he says, well, you make it. So basically it's like, yeah, serial killer could do all these things, but also I have these other good things. And that's kind of an interesting little take on it, but it's not, it's not like good, good deep change. So I'm saying a lot, but the basic idea is if you're hitting a yeah, but slow down, emotionally see what you might be missing. There's probably evidence that supports the thought that they're not telling you either because they're embarrassed about it. They're afraid to say it out loud, or it's kind of more of like a, a moralistic feeling that they have. Okay. And it could, Thank you. yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. I, I talk so much, right? I have so much to say about all the time, <laughs> but it, it is really, really interesting though. Well, it also seems like it might be helpful to then bring up that spectrum again, right? Mm -hmm. So serial, serial killers do do those things, but mm -hmm. they also kill people, which you don't, hopefully. Uh, so, well, yeah. And, and even if you do, like, are you killing, like, are you, are you killing bad people? Are you killing good people? But that's a, a whole other conversation, a whole other conversation. But, but hypothetically, if you were a serial killer, hypothetically, if you, if you were a bad person, like, there's kind of this, so what? Like, so is this, are you set in stone? Are you, are you concrete? Can you change, right? If, if you if you have done bad things, is that define who you are? Is there a path towards redemption? What do you, as the Stoics say, you have about 4,000 weeks on this earth and then you're dead and then it's all over. What are you gonna do with the time you have left? So you, you probably have two or two, one or 2,000 weeks left. So what are, what are we gonna do with that? Okay. The trial uh, BBT oh. is uh, Oliviera. Yeah, Olivia, right? It's, it's a, Iris, Iris, Iris Mar. Iris Mar, I love him. Yeah. So he. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no you're fine. I was, I was about to geek out about uh, core belief work, but I'll do that. Later. That's fine. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to summarize one other question that I think you touched on a little bit when you were talking about thought records. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's your take on the relative importance between the in session dialogue and collaborative discovery versus practice through thought records? You know, basically homework compliance and all of that. Yeah. How do you sort of balance those two things? These are like, if I could have like planted people in the audience to ask questions that I wanted to answer, like this is what I would have done. I feel like Jason just like knows me well and he's making these up. But thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. By the way, that, I, I was- That was, I was actually was, Nate Toma. He's a board member. And oh my gosh. Up with Nate, good Nate Toma's here? I'm a little embarrassed now. I feel like I should be smarter. But Nate, a big fan of your work, right? Oh my gosh. Did you read that? Oh, yeah, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. I'll geek out later. But um, I like that. So- Sorry, I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm fanboying a little bit. So, <laughs> um, so the, 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 what are we prioritizing? And I think, you know, stylistically, you have to find out what works for you and what works for the client. Uh, I have a lot of people who have a history of poor educational attainment and tend to have a, a, a paired association with worksheets in school and a paired association with school and failure schema. And there is certainly good work to be done there, but it's hard, hard to start there, right? So I typically tend to not focus a lot on do your thought records, do your worksheets. This is how change happens. I tend to focus more on in session. We're, we're working through the thought record verbally together, writing it down together. I'm using a shaping to help you successfully do more and more and more of it where I'm taking the lead, you're taking the lead. Um, but then at the typically at the end, I'm, I'm coming to, well, what's the takeaway message? What did we learn? What's the main idea? And then what are you going to do about it? So for me, for a lot of my folks, the homework isn't do this worksheet. Homework is do this behavior that's in line with this new perspective. Go and gather new information, do this skillful behavior, practice this skill, come back and we'll have new evidence to debrief. Um, but, but certainly I do have people who, um, it's the, the cognitive side is more important for them where they're thinking it's so ruminative, they get so stuck, where I might be you know, as in session, as they're, as they're able to see this is helpful for them, then I, I'm trying to have this still Socratic question about that, trying to see, 
Well, so we do this thing together, right? So we talk about what's going on, we break it down, we look at the thoughts. This seems to be helpful when, when it's the two of us, right? And they're like, oh yes, I love sessions, this is so nice, I wish I could carry you around with me. And I go, right, so you can't really carry me around, but I can teach you to do this, right? Like I wasn't born knowing this, right? You're easily as smart as I am. I can teach you the skill, you can do this too. So let me show you what I do. And I can teach you this and you can start doing it on your own. And then it's, it's less about like, do your homework or more about like, you can, you can be me and you can care, you can be me with you. I can be this kind of positive introject. <sighs> I don't know if I answered Nate's question though. I was just kind of nerdy that he was here. Nate, I love your work. I wondering, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if we should move on okay. now, just because we yeah. have a lot of questions and anything that we didn't get to, we'll just kind of keep it going and ask more later. I like it. Okay, sounds good. This was fun. You guys are good. Okay, so I'm going to share screen. I'm going to cover one point really fast, and then we're going to get into a role play. So now is the time to think about, do you want to be in a role play or not? Okay, let's see if I can do this one. Did I do it? I did it. I'm so good at Zoom. Okay. So, so we're trying to summarize it. If you are someone who thinks in like tables, oh, hang on a second. Uh, tables. So the basic idea is, is we're trying to build a new balanced and believable thought, but that's based on a process, right? So we have a summary and synthesis, the summary of what's the evidence that supports the initial assumption and the evidence that doesn't support the initial assumption, right? So seven column thought record, evidence for, evidence against, but this can be broken down, right? So what's the actual evidence, things that actually happened, um, and then what's the perceived evidence? So things that they were treating as evidence that wasn't actually evidence, things that was twisted, emotional reasoning, other thoughts. Oftentimes a thought is used as evidence for another thought. I'm sure you've come across that where you're doing a thought record and you say, well, what's the evidence you're a bad mom? And they're like, well, I'm lazy, I'm no good, I'm mean, I'm terrible. And you're saying, oh, these are, judgments can't support other judgments. That's not the way facts work. But there can be this kind of twisted evidence. On the other side, we have the things that they know, that, that the things they know but maybe don't remember, the exceptions, things this might not be true. And then the unknown evidence, the untwisted evidence, evidence that was ignored, evidence that they're avoiding, behavioral experiments, miscontext. I tend to focus a lot on that because I find that this is uh, interesting and also is quite impactful. And this is the piece that you miss if you're, well, some of these things are the things you miss if you're just doing just a thought record, right? If you're just saying, what's the evidence is true or not true, you're not slowing down to conceptualize and saying, wait a second, what's the, what's the behavior cycle you're stuck in here? How is this becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy? How is your avoidance creating the system that's reinforcing this? How is your control strategy making, create, ca causing you to not have new learning? Uh, we're going to talk about um, core belief stuff, um, stuff you might do in session. We'll take a break, and then we'll talk about core belief stuff you might do in between sessions, and we'll take a break as well. So share screen, oh, I have some, this one. Ah, we did it, cool. Uh, there we go, so working with core beliefs. So more graphics if you're someone who likes graphics. So uh, if this was an introductory CBT thing, we might be talking more about you know these levels of thoughts, the automatic thoughts or thoughts that happen just out of our awareness. People can, can access them. If, they, if, we, if they learn to notice them, they can notice them. Core beliefs are these deeper level of thoughts that people usually aren't aware of. Um, newer therapists will ask their clients directly, what are your core beliefs? And that never really, never really goes well. Um, here in Texas, if you ask a client, what are your core beliefs? They'll talk with you about their religious beliefs, which are important to know clinically, but a different thing than core beliefs. Uh, and intermediate beliefs are what connect the two. I'm a huge fan of intermediate beliefs and inter intermediate belief work. Um, so let's talk about this. So quick review, I'll kind of walk through this quickly and let's focus more on the intervention side of things. Um, so core beliefs are the deepest level of beliefs. Uh, schema and core beliefs, these are kind of overlapping, but not necessarily the distinct terms, largely because when people write about it, they write about it in different ways. And so there's a lack of specificity. So some authors write about a core belief and a schema as being the same thing. Some people write about a schema as being a perceptual filter. Some people write about schema as being a belief structure, um, an assumption, an attitude. So it's really hard to talk about schema in a specific way, but clinically you can then use schema kind of for whatever you want, which is kind of nice. Um, but our core beliefs affect how we feel, what we do. People can have positive and negative core beliefs. So they don't just have negative ones, they also have positive ones. 
uh, Beck wrote an excellent paper, the generic cognitive model uh, in 2014 with Emily Hay. Uh, excellent paper in that he talks about advances to the generic cognitive model and he talks about this idea that people don't just have negative core beliefs, they also have positive core beliefs. Core beliefs can be active or inactive depending on the circumstances of our life, which is why you might have a client who's doing very well, a major stressor happens and suddenly they're not doing very well because this previous core belief is now active. Uh, but clinically, the, the, neg the positive core belief is still there. We, we just need to activate it. It's helpful to know. Just what I'm saying here, it's already there. We, if we can shift the contingencies of their life, we can then try and activate the, the previous positive core belief. Um, modal activation is something that people are like really excited about. So Dr. Beck recently passed away uh, about a month ago exactly today, which is, uh, which is sad. Uh, earlier this year, some of the last writing he did was on the idea of modes. He was very excited about modes, adaptive modes, uh, recovery-oriented cognitive therapy modes. So I wrote uh, a book chapter with him in a memorial for Scott Lillenfield this past year. And in that, we wrote about modes, and he was very, very energized about it. So a mode is kind of a constellation of activation. Um, so the idea of a mode is you have, um, if, so say, for example, if you have depressed mode, uh, angry mode, perfectionist mode. This, this comes from the idea of schema therapy, right? So in the schema therapy, they have a lot of specific modes they're looking to activate. And you could use their specific titles. Personally, I like schema therapy, but I don't like the names of the modes in schema therapy. So I make, so I do it inductively. And with the client, I say, well, let's come up with a name for this. What should we call this, right? If I was working with um, Ella's client, I might say, well, what should we call this um, uh, parentified mode? Should we call this caretaking mode? Should we call this overextending mode, what, what should we call this mode? And in this mode that's keeping you stuck, what are, your, what are your specific thoughts, right? I have to do things for other people. I have to take care of them. What they want is more important than what I want. Patterns of thinking. These patterns of thinking might be all or nothing thinking. This might be kind of burying what I wanna do, maybe some resentment towards myself that I do this. Uh, what kind of behaviors do I engage in? I'm, well, I'm overdoing it for other people. I'm underdoing it for myself. And the affect, there's a lot of shame, a lot of guilt because I'm doing this because I feel bad, not because I'm choosing to do it, which doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It means I have very effective early training. So the, the whole idea is we want to figure out what's this mode that's keeping you stuck and we want not this mode. So in schema therapy, they're looking to change the... Uh, mode the person has by trying to foster a more adaptive mode. So if, if you get stuck in this caretaking mode and the caretaking mode is keeping you stuck, what's some, what do we want instead? Right? What do we want to call this? Do we want to call this um, balance mode? Do we want to call this healthy mode? Do we want to call this um, sustainable helping mode? It doesn't matter what we call it. It's good if we talk about it together and we come up with a definition. Usually I'll say to my clients, what should we call this? And then I write it down. I'll say, it'd be, I'll say, it'd be really helpful if we had a word that we both agreed on. What would, what would be a good word for that? And then we have some language to talk about, okay, so it sounds like you really were in caretaking mode. What do we got to do to get you back into sustainable mode? What do we got to get to to get you back into balanced living mode? Because when you're in balanced living mode, how are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you doing? How are you feeling? So one of the basic ideas of if this was schema therapy in an elevator, uh, which is, this is, that's not what this training is, but if this was schema therapy in an elevator, the basic idea would be you want to help them identify the mode that's not working for them. You want to figure out the more healthy mode and you want to help them as much as possible access and bolster this new mode. And then the, the brain is all connections, as they say, uh, brains that are neurons that fire together, wire together. Is that the saying? So if we can get people to access and, and continue to activate and engage in this other side of the mode, we can help bolster and activate this new mode. So that's something that's very exciting. If you read uh, the, new, the recent stuff uh, out from uh, Beck, he talks about modes a lot. Judy was saying that the, she just came out with the third edition of Basics and Beyond. She was saying the fourth edition is probably going to be a lot about modes. So it's a, kind of a newer idea that people are excited about. It might just be because it's like a newer idea, so it's something else to write about. But it's certainly an interesting interesting process. Clients find it to be helpful if you can kind of map out this, because usually what um, Ella was talking about with her client was there's kind of these discrepancies, right? Where like, there's, there's, there's who I was, who I'm trying to be, and it's hard, they, there's kind of this shifting back and forth. So it can be helpful to have some language to talk about who you're trying to be, who, who, and old me, new me kind of stuff.
keep an eye on the time. We're doing all right. So when do we want to move into core belief and schema work? Um, so there are a number, there are things that we can do that make it easier to do core belief work and schema work, right? So there are, usually we're not starting with the core belief in the very first session. Um, you, you could try to, it's just, it's just hard to do. So usually you want to have a good relationship of trust, right? If we're working on a, a deeper level of, uh, of a belief, usually the, the deeper the work, the more severe the presentation, the more important the relationship is. So you want to have good rapport with them. You want them to know that they can trust you. They want them to know that you can help them, that you've helped them in the past. We want a shared understanding of, of their conceptualization. So we want to know, you know, what is, what is this thing that we're going after? Or what is this belief that's, that's keeping us stuck? What's this mode or the schema that's keeping us stuck? We want to have a, a language we both can use about it. Uh, they need some distress tolerance skills, right? If they don't, if they if they don't have these already, we're doing distress tolerance training, because usually at some point of core belief work, the feelings change last, right? So usually, if we're getting someone to change what they do. Right, so with Ella's client, he uh, needs to stop overextending himself. And there's not a way to say, here's a coping card of three things to tell yourself to not feel bad and you won't feel bad. That's not how, human ch how humans change, right? You can do that, but he's still gonna feel really bad, right? A good coping card would be, I'm gonna feel bad doing this, but I'm gonna do it anyways because I want long-term change. It's okay to feel guilty in the short term. I'm not doing anything wrong. If I, if I stick with this, I'll, it, uh, the guilt will subside, I'll habituate. That would be a good coping card. But so part of this is doing something that feels counterintuitive, counter your training. And if you can hang with that distress, the then you can do things that are different. You can have new learning. So usually I have clients around this part say like, I feel kind of scared, right? With, with, with the owner, the client I was talking about before, there was this place where like she was engaging in an authentic life and it was exciting and terrifying to her. She was like, I didn't know it was like this. This is so scary, but I love this. And I was like, yes, I love this. Let's hang with this. Uh, we want to teach them cognitive restructuring skills. In, in, in general terms, we want them to have been able to do good cognitive restructuring for the more surface level stuff before we get into the deeper stuff. The idea being you can't learn to drive on the freeway, right? See, so we're gonna learn with the easier stuff. And once you get good at it, then we're gonna slowly move up. Uh, we're gonna use those skills to bring about some change in their life or reduce the stress. So they've used skills, they've had some benefit from it. They believe in, you know what, Dr. Watman, when we break things down, that's really helpful for me. Can we keep doing that? Yeah, you bet we can, that's my favorite thing. And we're trying to build up new, new patterns of behavior. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I know I have a lot of kind of nerding out moments. So my master's thesis, I looked at um, premature termination in uh, training clinics. And what we found was that um, most people in a training clinic drop out very early on. Some people drop out a little bit on, and most people don't stay long enough for a full course of treatment. And then if you add on the fact that you're there for like an odd period of time where you have a lot of transfer clients, um, what there was this interesting like unintended finding, which was that uh, trainees tend to get a lot of training on how to start therapy. They get some therapy, they get some training on how to do the middle part of therapy. They don't get a lot of training on the later stages of, of therapy because they're, they often don't have clients who are there unless they're kind of forever clients of the clinic. So with that, there's, um, there's kind of a need for more understanding about how to do core belief work. So how do we identify the core beliefs, right? So you could uh, use kind of a schema questionnaire. You could have a core belief list and say like, do you have these? Which of these do you identify with? Um, you can look for themes, right? So across the situations that are challenging for you, what are the situations that are most challenging for you? What are the hot thoughts? What is the emotional meaning of your hot thoughts, right? If you're, uh, because I know I'm talking with CBTers, right? I can say, if you're doing the Judy Beck case conceptualization diagram and you're looking to see what are situations are typical of what's challenging for you? In those situations, what are your thoughts? What's the emotional meaning of those thoughts? That's gonna be the theme of what the core beliefs are. We're trying to map out the conceptualization. Uh, and, and there's a lot of ways to do that. At some point, Judy was saying that she, that she wouldn't recommend using her diagram with people in session because they might feel like you're trying to put them in the box. Um, I, if I conceptualize in session with my clients, I'm typically not doing the Judy Bat case substitution diagram, it's good. I just typically, I typically just don't do it. Um, typically I'll do that thing where I draw it out. So I'll try and figure out, so what's the underlying belief? What's the prediction you have? What's the behavior that goes with that? What's the outcome? How are you filtering it? Cause that seems to be kind of more free form. And I can tell, I can tell that the client 
I don't know that I understand this correctly. Here's what I'm hearing. I feel like I'm missing something. Help me see what I'm missing. And it's less me saying like, look, I have y'all figured out. Because uh, if, if I'm wrong, I don't want to tell them that I'm right because um, it's easier to, to recover and say, I don't know that I really have this. Have them like, oh no, that's totally right. That's just easier. Uh, there's the downward arrow. So the downward arrow is something you saw me doing in the role play, right? So if this was true, right, that it was selfish to do what you want to do instead of what they want to do, what would that mean, right? If it was true that you were, uh, that, you, that you don't actually want to be around your kids, what would that mean, right? If, if this was true, what would that mean? Um, I, I uh, want to um, just say it's important to say the if or the hypothetical piece um, sometimes when I'm listening to audios from trainees, the person will say a painful thought, and then the therapist will say, well, what does that mean about you? Because they're trying to do the downward arrow. But that's not actually the downward arrow, right? What that is is tacitly agreeing with the belief and then saying, it, saying because that's true, what does that mean about you? Which is slightly different. So, so I, I try to say to my clients, I don't know if that's true or not, but hypothetically, if that thought was true, what would that mean about you? Uh, because I don't want them to think that I think it's true. And then hypothesis testing, right? So once we have an idea what the core belief is, we keep in mind that we might be wrong, right? Usually there's something you don't know about the client that you don't figure out until partway through therapy. So you're, so you're keeping an eye out for, well, what am I missing? Am I right? This is a hypothesis, but I could be wrong with it. So a downward uh, arrow, I'm going to quickly walk through this because we did this in the role play. Um, so the basic idea is, is once you find a thought that seems to be emotionally important, meaning it's connected with their, with the, their presenting problem, it's connected with the behavior that's keeping them stuck, we're going to say, well, this seems to be an important thought. Uh, we're going to say, well, I want to take a look at this. Or you, could, you can explain, I'm going to ask you hypothetically what this, what this means, what to say about you. Um, you, can do, you can explain it formally or informally. Usually I just try to explain to the client, I want to take a look at that. Hypothetically, if that was true, what would that mean? Um, and then I'm going to keep going until I find the, the belief the questions that trainees often ask is how, how often do I keep going? And there's not a hard, fast answer. Sometimes you get there very fast. Sometimes you don't. Um, so either you go until you hit a loop or you go until you hear a change in the emotion. If you do it enough, you'll learn to kind of hear that kind of, there's almost like a sadness and like a relief in saying it. Like, I guess that means I'm a bad mother. I guess that means I'm not good enough. But if you listen, you'll kind of hear it. Um, example core beliefs. So there's much, much more than this, but there's oftentimes we see beliefs about helplessness, unlovable, and worthlessness. Um, though I tend to not tell my clients, hey, here's some beliefs, which ones do you have? I tend to kind of work more inductively with them. So let's talk about some in-session strategies we might use with our clients. So we could use uh, traditional Socratic questioning. This is a lot of stuff which I've, I've, I covered earlier. The goal is always to make these flexible. So if you're someone who has anxiety about Scott isn't reading everything, I'm not that good of a reader anyway, so you don't want to hear me read everything. But the, the basic idea is that it's really, really unlikely to have one single conversation where you change a core belief. You know, people, if these are beliefs that are kind of built brick by brick, and if you take them apart brick by brick, uh, we're trying to we're trying to work for incremental change. But because we're doing that, we're talking with the client about that. We're explaining the process. We're explaining to them, this seems to be a pretty important belief, right? This seems to be a belief that's central or a core belief to what's keeping you stuck. This seems like you've believed this for a while, so it's probably going to take us a while to work on this. So we're going to we're going to incrementally chip away at this. Um, so we're, so typically we might kind of do a, a broader one, and as we do a broader evaluation, we're seeing what are the what are the the main pieces of evidence, and then we might focus on those pieces of evidence, right? So you might have seen that with. Um, in the example with Ella, right, where there was this idea of I'm selfish, one of the pieces of I'm selfish was this assumption that if I don't, if I'm doing the right thing, but not because I really want to, that's selfish. Okay, well, that's interesting. Let's look at that. And there's a lot of other pieces to work on. Um, and we're going to focus on what are they hold, what holds the most evidence. We're going to track situations. We're looking to increase modal activation. We're looking to see where are things changing for them. We're paying attention. There's a lot of moving parts. We can look to do a cognitive continuum, which we talked about earlier. So the idea is, is we're trying to introduce cognitive flexibility, right? So if you think you're selfish, we're trying to help people move in the direction of being more flexible. So here's the idea of no one cares about me. Well, we can map this out to a continuum of people hate you. They always hate you. You're, 
Martin Screlli, the person that everyone hates the most. Maybe people hate other people more than him. Do you remember that? That um, Pharma Bro guy? That was pretty interesting. Um, and then the team can go the other way around. So drawing out a continuum is a way to introduce cognitive flexibility. Where are you at? Well, you know, um, and we can kind of track it as we move through it. So I'm selfish. Are you, there's different levels of selfish, right? So there's people who are selfish who only do what they want to do. And there's people who are selfish who know what they should do and don't do it. There's people who are selfish and do what they, what they uh, do the right thing but do it for the wrong reasons. There's a kind of altruism and selfishness. We could kind of draw out the continuum and the idea isn't that we land on what the right answer is, but the idea is we're trying to introduce cognitive flexibility, get people thinking less rigidly, more flexibly so we can get some movement. Imagery, uh, I'm a big fan of imagery. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read this quote because it's worth reading and then I'll talk about uh, imagery. So Christine Podesky, um, so she did that great talk in 1993, which is amazing. Uh, in uh, 2019, she did another talk at the World Congress. She did a keynote uh, kind of updating on, on her views for Socratic uh, questioning, Socratic dialogue. And imagery has become an important part of, of her work. So she says, I encourage therapists to identify images whenever possible and to test out test these out using Socratic dialogue. Both negative and positive imagery can be integrated with other CBT interventions, such as thought record, to increase their emotional impact and meaning. So the idea is, is as possible, we want to fold in imagery. And the reason that we, we do that is imagery is really emotionally evocative. So what we said before, remember that uh, Jamie asked the question that someone else wrote down of, what do you do when the person intellectually knows something, but emotionally doesn't know it? Where imagery is a good strategy to work with, right? Where we're trying to help, act, trying to help them access both the situations that, that had to do with this. Well, so imagery, there's two different ways to go about this. So one of this is, um, what, what Christine would talk about, which would be trying to help people either envision things from the past or picture things from the future. So we're trying to, as we're talking about these previous experiences, these injuries, these instances that support your belief, we're gonna slow down. We're gonna process these emotionally, almost like you might process a trauma. So we're gonna walk through this in an emotionally activating way to really access that emotion so we can have real healing. And as we plan out new behaviors, we're going to have the person imagine them doing it to help kind of use their prospective memories. So they're plugging in cues of how it's going to go. So it's more normal to get there. Great way to do imagery. I sometimes also do imagery kind of like almost like in a, uh, like a Jungian kind of way where I'll try and pull in like what are images that have like symbolism that can be helpful for you. Right, like so. Typically, if I see, well, what's the th the emotional theme of the mode that we're trying to counter, and what would be a symbol that might be in, in line with the mode we're trying to have more of? Right. So, I once had a guy who had a lot of feelings of franticness in his in his life. He felt like he was never really good enough, and what would happen is uh, he he was really really successful, but if ever anyone had questioned him, he would immediately think he wasn't good enough, and he would get very frantic, and he would start behaving in behaviorally um, ineffective ways that would cause problems. And so the, the image that we used was the symbol of a mountain, right? Because the mountain was really stable and he would kind of pull up this imagery of, I am the mountain, I am stable, I am constant. Uh, things might change, but I am always here. And that was really helpful for him. I had a guy who I was doing some social anxiety work uh, work for um, like, like social for speaking and for him the imagery was Michael Jordan right where he would he would tell us so he'd be like you know I got this I'm in my, I'm in my zone I'm really good at this I'm Michael Jordan and it worked really well for him right so uh, I'm trying to figure out is there an image is there a song is there something is there something you can pull up that's going to help you access that that image that has some symbolism that can be pretty helpful uh, distress tolerance work we talked about so doing something different can be really really scary and we have to help people tolerate the distress of doing something different that can be scary uh usually normalizing for people like like we are in the real part of the work right now this is challenging this is difficult your brain is wired one way and you're trying to rewire it a different way and that's going to be scary because your brain is going to tell you this isn't safe don't do this because what's most comfortable is what you've always done but it's also really not comfortable because that's why you're here so the easiest thing to do would be to keep rescuing other people. The easiest thing to do would be to stay in the cycle because you know it very well. Um, not doing, so for Ella's client, right? So not engaging in that rescuing behavior, not engaging in caretaking, saying no to unreasonable requests or just saying no, just practice saying no is going to be really, really uncomfortable for him, especially if, if he's not in that burnt out place, right? Doing that where it's not like a dickish behavior, but like assertive, normal caretaking behavior 
that's going to be a corrective emotional experience, but it's going to be really scary for him. So he needs to have good distress tolerance skills. When people confront their fears, they tolerate discomfort. We need to help them do this. Uh, if they have good skills they use on their own, we can normalize it. Um, if, they, if they don't have good skills yet, we can teach them good distress, good distress tolerance skills. Most of the good CBT distress tolerance skills have been co-opted into DBT, and you pull them from the DBT manuals. Uh, it's interesting to read, you know, you're like, oh, this is all DBT, but it's all C it's CBT as well. But there's a lot of good skills that exist. Find out what works for them. Whatever you're good at, do that. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis is, is, is another kind of classic strategy of things to do in session with the client. So this is uh, the PowerPoint version of one of the uh, cost-benefit analysis forms from the book. It's definitely prettier when it's not in PowerPoint. But basically, we're looking to see, so what's the belief we're looking to change, right? So this idea that I'm selfish if I, if I don't help other people out. How does this help me? How does this hurt me? So what do I get out of this? Well, when I take care of other people, I feel not guilty. Right? I feel bad if I don't do it. If I, if I do it, at least I won't feel as guilty. I still feel guilty because I, I don't really want to do this. How does it hurt me? Well, it exhausts me. It's not sustainable. It, it, it furthers this narrative of me being a, a caretaker in an, un, in an unbalanced way. Are there additional benefits that come from believing, uh, believing this belief? Well, if, I don't have to change, right? Are there additional costs that come from believing this belief? Yeah, I think I think I'm bad. I think I'm I'm uh, worthless. I think I'm a selfish person. Are there additional benefits that come from behaving as if this was true? It's familiar. I know what to do. Although I have these short sense of relationships, they're they're usually really good at the beginning. As people like be, being taken care of. Are there costs? Yeah, I have good relationships that don't last long because I can't keep it up because no one can. This is an unrealistic expectation. Um, so then we're going to rate importance of these. We're looking to see, um, is this helping me towards my goals? Does believing this help me to behave in a way that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if I overdo it, is there a way that that's ultimately leading me to recreate the injury or uh, create a system that's uh, sustaining my belief? Yeah. So for him, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because he overdoes it till he hits the exhaustion point. And then once he's exhausted, then he um, hits it like the burnout resentment point. And then when he, then he, um, when he burnt out and resentful, he stops doing things. And for the people, for them, it, it probably feels like he's really letting them down because they thought he was like Superman, right? They thought he was going to take care of them forever. And when he stops doing it, they're probably mad at him. Like, how are you doing this? For? You know, I thought you were really going to be, be there for me. I thought you were different. And then he only pays attention to that. And he goes, I really am. I'm so terrible. Next time I'm going to really do it better. And patterns of over control, under control, over control, under control. So what's the lesson? What do I want to do about it? And then it, I might lo look to do this on the new belief we're trying to build up. So this is um, useful and it helps people look at, look at it, but usually the, the, the benefit is it helps people do something different. Most people don't believe their core beliefs because they think they're advantageous. Usually they believe them because it's um, what they've come, what, what their system uh, keeps going. Chair work is another good strategy, right? So if I was working with uh, Ella's client, I would love to do some chair work with um, him now and him when he was a kid taking care of his siblings. So if him now understands these expectations that were put on me then weren't reasonable and this, although I was doing it because I had to do this, this wasn't, this wasn't, this wasn't normal. This wasn't, uh, this is too much to put on a kid. It's okay for me then to have resentment towards this. It's okay for me then to not want to do this. The things I wanted to do, those were valid. If I could get current him to have a conversation with previous him about that uh, through a two-chair exercise, that would be really, really awesome. Um, and that's what we would look to do. So usually chair work looks like that, where you're trying to help the person now explain to person then kind of what the person now didn't didn't know. And we're trying to figure out what, what did you then need that you didn't get, right? What, he, what him then needed that didn't get is probably validation that like it was okay to not want to do things for other people and uh, acknowledgement that this was a problem that he was solving. It wasn't something he made and that he shouldn't have to do this forever. So chair work is a really powerful way to work towards this. Not every client is willing to do chair work. So for the people who aren't willing to do chair work, uh, we'll do letters, right? So let's get you to write a letter to a younger version of yourself. Uh, usually, I'll, I'll, if I'm doing letters with the client, I'm saying, well, I really should be having you do chair work. But if you're not doing this, I guess. 
I guess I can let you get away with just letters. I guess I can't believe I'm letting you get away with this. But really, like, I'm getting you two letters. That's pretty cool. But I'm framing this as like, a, well, I really should be having you do this harder thing. Um, if you're if you're absolutely not willing to do this, you know, we could kind of weigh the pros and cons of this. In the meantime, why don't we do the letter first, and we'll kind of see how you feel about it. And the idea of the letter is, is, is we're trying to access the emotion of it. We're trying to get them to see well, what was the thing that you then needed to know now? What, what, are, what are the things you would want them to say in a two chair exercise? And can we get them to, to channel that into a letter and then write it and read it and write it and read it. And if your client's like, well, what am I gonna do? What am I sending this for, right? We can say, well, the, 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 the point that the, the healing comes from not mailing it, the healing comes from walking, walking through this and emotionally and cognitively processing it. So those are some of the things you might do in session. Um, let's take a break. We're right on time. I caught up. I'm so excited. I was, we were a little bit behind. Perfect. So let's take a little bit of a break. I think we have 15 minutes and then we will um, come back. We'll talk about across session strategies. Okay. So let's talk more about uh, other things we can do. I already have my zoom up. Look, I'm like a zoom expert these days. So things, so we talked about things you do within one session. There's other things you do across sessions. So um, evidence logging, the idea is, is that, you know, if you have evidence that supports the thought, evidence that doesn't support the thought, we want evidence that supports the core belief, evidence that doesn't support the core belief. Uh, but usually it ends up being kind of a longer term thing, right? So the, the way that I typically frame this to my clients is I'll say, so, um, if I'm drawing out the belief, prediction, behavior, outcome filter, I'm typically saying, so the, the way the brain works is the brain tends to pay attention to things that confirm what it thinks is going to happen. We tend to miss things that we don't expect. So you tend to only notice things that support your beliefs about yourself. You tend to not notice things that do, uh, do not support the beliefs of yourself. So we, we need to retrain your filter. I need you to start noticing and paying attention to the things you typically don't notice. So what I want you to do is I want you to keep a running list of all the things you typically don't notice. So depending on the client, right? So if we think about Fiona, uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about the idea that I'm not a good mom, I want you to start logging all the times you're doing things well. I want you to start logging all the things that you're doing things successfully. If we're thinking about her belief that um, it's not okay to be vulnerable and other people aren't are going to be vulnerable either, then she's logging all the times that she was a radically um, open individual and has like wholehearted living and all the Brene Brown stuff. And she's logging all of those examples of, I did this and it was scary, but it went well. I did this and it was scary and it went well. So, so what we log is usually based on what we think they typically miss. And then we're looking to get them to pay attention to these things and log them over times. And eventually we get um, kind of like a, just like a preponderance of evidence. I'm like, well, look at all of this stuff. How, how do we make sense of this? And this last piece, right? So impactful items in the list can be good candidates for imagery strategies. This I really like to do. So if we find the, the, the stuff, the really important stuff that, that they, they normally don't notice, if we can focus on developing those, creating some imagery around those things they can call up when they need them, that can be really helpful as well, right? So I had a client who recently had, uh, was in crisis after a, a relationship breakup and they thought no one cared about them. As they've been working through this, we found some good instances from their past where there was very, very profound moments of feeling like people really cared about them. And we, we, we bolstered those up for imagery strategies as something to review to help him remember um, that, that people care about him. Of course, that's one piece and all of the other pieces, but look into evidence log and build it in together. People need to learn how to notice these things. So you might initially be pointing out, here's the things in session you normally don't notice. These are the exact things I want you to notice. Sorting of evidence. Uh, so this is kind of a modification. You know, there's core belief, uh, hypothesis A, hypothesis B. I'm sure people who treat health anxiety are familiar with that strategy. The idea of you have this catastrophic prediction, there's a more, a more balanced prediction, and then we're seeing which one does the evidence support. Uh, so core belief A, core belief B is a way to see if we have this old belief we're trying to restructure, we have this new belief we're trying to build up, right? Old belief, I'm not good enough. New belief, I am good enough. Old belief, I'm selfish. Uh, new belief, uh, I'm allowed to be a full human. Old belief, I'm a bad mother. New belief, I'm a good enough mother. Old belief, it's, there's something wrong with me. New belief, there's nothing wrong with me that's not wrong with everyone else. I'm, I'm human. Then we're looking to see the, as they go through important experiences in their life, which one does it, which one does it fall into? Because there probably still be 
will be things that support the old belief um, because usually the old belief is kind of uh, kind of a twist of, of the facts, but it's a way to acknowledge, yeah, some stuff does still happen, but it's not, it's not the whole picture. And it might be that we end up with a new core belief that's maybe like a, a hybridized or a more balanced look at the two. So this is something, so the idea is this is kind of a running log we're tracking. I might have the client track this formally on their own, or I might have in my ledger as things happen, I'm tracking it and then I'm trying to get them to start doing it. And I'm showing them that I'm tracking it and they're going, oh, that's cool. I wish I had that. And I go, I can teach you how to do this. There are forms for this, though. Usually at this point, I'm just having people do it on their smartphone. That seems to be like better than worksheets at this point in people's lives. Like open up the, the notes, the, the notes app and put, put it in there or put it in your drafts and Twitter. Um, sorting evidence is a good kind of overall across session strategy to use. Um, intermediate beliefs, uh, I'm going to nerd out for just a little bit, uh, but then we're going to come back and talk. So, so we spent a lot of time talking about how do we change core beliefs. So my belief is that the way we change core beliefs is by, is by changing the intermediate beliefs, by changing the rules that maintain the core beliefs. I have no data to support that, though. So I'm not going to tell you that like there's some kind of ordering study or some kind of uh, dismantling study that's shown that. But clinically, this is what I do, and it seems to be helpful. So the idea of the intermediate belief is this is the conditional assumption. This connects with what am I afraid is going to happen and what am I doing, right? So I'm afraid that I'm, that I'm going to be selfish. So behaviorally, what I'm doing is I'm taking care of other people instead of myself. If I take care of other people, then, I, then they won't notice that I'm selfish. If I do what I want to do, then I'm really selfish. I'm a bad person. If I open up to people and tell them that I'm depressed and tell them what's going on for me, then uh, they're going to judge me. But if I mask and if I hide my depression, then I'll be okay. So if I try, then I'll fail. But if I don't try, then I can't fail. We're trying to connect. What are you afraid is going to happen? What is your avoidance strategy? What is your control strategy? And how is this keeping you stuck? So in our, our suck point study that we did, we also looked at the uh, case and self relation stuff. And we found that Trainers often reported intermediate beliefs were the hardest things for people to, to create. Um, it's a challenging thing to do. So people often, therapists often need help in learning how to identify what are the uh, conditional assumptions. So um, a possible compensatory strategy for if I speak up and tell people what I want, then they'll let me down and reject me. Now the, there can be different kinds of responses that go with this, right? So one belief could look different for different people. So in, in the schema therapy literature, they talk about uh, there could be a belief consistent response, an overcompensatory response, or a belief avoidant response. So the person can behave as if the belief is true, right? So if I speak up, people will reject me, then I'm going to not speak up. They can overcompensate and they can say, well, I'm not, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to be very, very verbal. I'm not going to accept anything. I'm going to be kind of like uh, selfish, aggressive, hostile. Or they could just avoid relationships altogether. Or if you think about Ella's client, right? This idea of if I do what I want to do instead of what they want me to do, then I'm selfish, right? The belief consistent response is people pleasing, self sacrificing to a point of self detriment and burnout. Overcompensating would be to say, I'm, you know, if I do this, I'm selfish, but they're demanding of me. This isn't fair. I'm going to only do what I want to do, kind of like rugged individualism, which also might be pathological. And then avoid it would be, so I'm just going to avoid other people altogether. So we can figure out what are they doing. We can figure out how do we get them unstuck. Which is what we have here, just written, written down in better language. This is more from um, my CBT Instagram. My stuff's OK. Uh, uh, so we want, ultimately, we want to help them create a less vicious cycle. right? So if we have. For example, if someone has beliefs that they are incompetent and these beliefs about being incompetent lead them to have predictions of failure, um, then the, if, if they think they're going to fail, they don't do anything. They avoid. And if they avoid, they don't succeed. If they don't succeed, they don't have a lot of achievement. So when they go to say, well, what, what, what do I have to show for my life? There's not a lot that I have to show for. Look how incompetent I am. So the belief they have affects what they think is going to happen. And that affects what they do. What they do affects what happens. Uh, what happens affects the evidence they have to look at. And then they still kind of twist the evidence, right? They don't say, well, look how, you know, look how avoidant I am in my life. Look how afraid I am in my life. They say, well, look, I'm, I, I'm such a failure. I'm such a loser. I haven't accomplished anything. 
similar to the, the role play with Ellis Klein. So Ellis Klein has this belief of, you know, I'm a selfish person. So the prediction is, um, if, if I don't do for other people, then I'm bad, I'm selfish, this isn't right. And so they engage in this over, overdoing behavior, which ultimately is gonna lead to, the, the outcome of that's gonna be burnout, right? You can't do more than you can do in a long-term way. This is where they get burnt out, they get resentful, they stop doing stuff, and then they go, look how resentful I am, look how unmotivated I am, I am a selfish person, and they're stuck. And so we wanna help them get unstuck by taking apart the wheel. So how do we do that? So we take their beliefs, uh, their predictions of what's happening, and we're looking to use cognitive strategies and behavioral strategies to come at this. So basically, if we want to change the belief, right, we're going to use cognitive strategies to evaluate what are the, the, the automatic in the moment thoughts you're having, what are the assumptions you're having that are driving these. We're going to do behavioral experiments, right? We need a different system, so you need to do something different. And if we, if we get you making different predictions and doing something different, something else is going to happen if, if you have control over the situation. We might need to do some skills training. We might need to problem solve and troubleshoot. But if we can change the system, something different is going to happen. If something different is going to happen, there could be new learning. And they'll notice the new learning if we as their therapists say, hey, look at this. Did you see something different happen this time? Are you paying attention to this? Did you notice this? What did you think was going to happen? What usually happens? What happened this time? What do you make of that? Let me write that down. And from there, we get more balanced beliefs about the self. These, these are my great Instagram graphics. I mean, my great um, PowerPoint graphics. So across sessions, we're looking to, to, we're looking to log evidence. We're looking to draw out the cycle. We're looking to help people do things differently. We're getting them to use their distress tolerance skills. It all comes back to modes. Right, so we're trying to get people to, we're trying to figure out what's the mode that's keeping them stuck and what's the new mode we're trying to build up. So what's the new kind of belief? What's the, what's, you know, can we use cognitive strategies to, to bolster this? Can we find behavioral strategies to help test this out? What's the new pattern of thinking? If, there's, if the old pattern of thinking was rumination, catastrophizing, um, victim role, things like that, can we get them out of that? Can we get them to a new pattern of thinking? We get them doing new, more skillful behaviors, different behaviors, more balanced behaviors, behaviors in line with their values and goals. And ultimately, it's going to help foster a, a new emotional uh, place, which the, the emotional side we can also target with imagery strategies as well. We have just enough time to do a role play, a debrief, and questions and answers. So let's do that, because that, that is my jam. So I'm going to turn this off, and then I'm going to see, do we have a volunteer I feel like I'm so good at Zooming at this, at this point. Okay, so we have time. We have 15 minutes. This is perfect for questions, comments, non sequiturs. Um, so I'll put these back down. <laughs> I, I guess I didn't have to put the slide back up. Uh, so let me put this down. And I imagine we have some questions, right? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, let's see. So one person had two questions, so it's a two okay. for one. Um, I like it. In your opinion, why does Socratic questioning um, with core beliefs work? What do you think is are the main mechanisms of change? Um, and is there any issue population you would not use this with? Oh, that's three questions. Okay, so first, why do I think Socratic questioning works slash what is the mechanism of change? I really like a paper that uh, Rob DeRubis, uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, I was just calling him Lorenzo, I always forget his third name. Lorenzo and uh, Ramirez German wrote, uh, it was in CPR on the cognitive mediation, looking at how everything is kind of cognitively mediated no matter what you're doing. So on um, so I view it all as cognitive mediation, but the, the reason I think that it works is because usually it's very, I have a very good idea of what I think the right answer is gonna be. I have the idea of what I think the client needs to think. And if I just tell them it's too easy and people don't, don't take it in, also I'm wrong because I don't know all the facts. Um, but I think, it, I think um, there's a, a few things that make it work well for people. One, there is, like the emotional process, there's the, the emotional support they get. There's helping people reprocess their previous experiences in a more linear way, uh, almost like a trauma processing of their beliefs, which, which is helpful. But I think, I think what ultimately makes Socratic questioning for core beliefs work is that we're, we're, we're guiding people to mentally take a step back, look at, see the big picture, right? Like, to have people not see the trees, but to see the forest. 
And once they see the big picture helping them figure out, well, this is what I've been stuck in. Do I want to keep doing this or do I want to do something else? In my experience, um, core belief work isn't as impactful if it's purely verbal, right? So it, it's a layering process. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever carried something that was heavier than you could carry and you kind of wiggle walked it where you pick up one end and kind of swivel it and you pick up the other end and kind of swivel it and you kind of do that. Maybe this is like a toxic masculinity thing where I'm like, I can't ask for help. I'm going to walk this thing. But that's kind of like what good therapy can be like sometimes, right? Where I use cognitive work to get a little bit of wiggle room. And then I guess, then, there, then we, they, behaviorally, we do something. And as we did something, cognitively, we process it. And it's kind of a layering of cognitive and behavioral strategies. So I don't think the answer is your question. Uh, cognitive mediation, is there a population I wouldn't use this with? There's a lot of considerations with there. So I wouldn't be starting with core belief work um, and if someone didn't have a good grounding in our relationship and cognitive skills, if they hadn't already made good goals. Also, not everyone wants or needs to do core belief work, right? So me, so us as clinicians, we're super interested in this, like, this is fun work. But some people are coming in saying, like, I just want to work on this. I want to work on symptom reduction. I want to work on getting my job back. I want to work on improving my relationship. And for them, that, that's fine. If you're moving into um, people with more emotion dysregulation, so like borderline personality disorder, uh, in the book, uh, Lynn McFarr, uh, who's brilliant in DBT and CBT, wrote a chapter on Socratic strategies from a DBT perspective, and she talks about kind of the jazz, the movement, speed, and flow we see in DBT of trying to help keep people regulated, be appropriately directive, move towards guided discovery, keep people on task, and do it in a way that's focused on behavior change. It's a very, it's like, it's like a double chapter. It's very, it's very long, but it's very, very good. Um, so if someone has, but main, main principles there would be, so traditionally you might think about cognitive strategies as a way to reduce the stress, get people regulated. If someone has persistent emotional regulation, you might be using regulation strategies to get them regulated, then using uh, Socratic strategies to, to help them see things differently, but then focus on what are you going to do differently. It's my long and short of it. If, obviously, if someone is like inebriated, you're not going to do it, right? You can't have a rational conversation with someone who is drunk. Don't do that. That's that's them. And and we're not going to force it, right? So you're not going to. We're not we're not lawyers, right? So what lawyers try and do is they try and they try and um prove you wrong, right? They get you to agree to it to a general thing, and then they try and, and they try and corner you into that. Uh, so with I could have tried to do that with this role play with Larry, right? Where I could have talked about in general what is someone who's good enough, and then like aren't you this, aren't you this, aren't you this, how dare you not say that, which isn't going to be good work. We're not trying to, uh, we're not car salesmen. People don't get better when they admit to us the belief we want. People get better when they make changes in, in their life. And uh, we do this openly and honestly. Um, so I was just thinking similarly that this probably wouldn't be the best tactic to use with someone who's pr primarily presenting with OCD, where you're not necessarily yes, trying to challenge. Thank you for saying that. I love that. I thought, yeah, in my head, I was just like, obviously, but yeah. So obviously we're not going to, we're not going to engage with obsessions, right? You, you can't rationalize the obsessions. That would be a great way to waste a lot of money and make someone much, much sicker. We're going to use exposure and response prevention because obviously that's, what, that's where the evidence is. You can use cognitive strategies to help consolidate learning around exposure and trust prevention on what, what were you afraid was going to happen, what actually happened, what did we learn from this, but you're definitely not going to get really far with just that. Okay, so there is another. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Okay. Um, so, how do you get a client who can talk back to negative beliefs but still remains anxious? They hold both negative beliefs and ration, uh, rational alternatives with high conviction. So, both at the same time. Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty pretty common. So, usually that's where I'm starting to move into core belief work. Right when somebody has kind of this idea of like, I'm really afraid to do this emotionally like I kind of think like that like my therapist is right and this is going to work but like this is like the first time I've ever done this and this is so scary I mean that's that incremental change piece by piece work right so we're trying to figure out when do you believe this the most when do you believe this the most what behaviors you need to change we're normalizing the process usually what clients are saying is like how do I make the feelings go away all right what's the thought I need to tell myself so I'm not anxious anymore and probably change is going to happen by them learning to not be afraid of being afraid by them having that wholehearted open experience and it's going to be perhaps a messy kind of life, but it's exciting, right? Like that's, if you, if you can help people see that, like, it's, it's scary, but exciting, like fear is both sides. You're, you're on a roller coaster, but like, it's not, a, it's only a bad roller coaster if you awfulize it, but this is yet one life, how you want to live it. That it's just, it's, it's good and scary, but scary in a good way.
if they can learn to be open to their experience. So somebody asked, would you do anything differently if the target belief is about others or the future? And why Jennifer yeah. asking that? Yeah, well, that, that probably gears towards the, there was a question about core belief work related to I'm a bad person versus other people or the world. Right? So if someone had a, an idea that the world is dangerous, the future is hopeless, then we could approach that differently. I might be looking to do uh, some trauma assessment and see if there needs to be some trauma processing because that might be pretty likely, even if it's not PTSD, but something that's more like post-traumatic uh, depression, which is actually maybe more common than PTSD. But um, I might be moving into some trauma processing with that. <clears throat> but still, things I'm going to look at is I'm going to be focusing on, you know, what do you have control over? What are you going to focus on? Because so learned helplessness we'll see a lot, right? Where people have this idea of I can't make the situation better things are bad but things are bad because of other people and um those tend to be kind of exhausting therapy patients to have because they want to come in and they have a lot to say but they aren't, aren't making changes because they don't think they can because that's by definition what learned helplessness is right what they tried to do didn't work and they say well obviously it's not me in those cases i'm looking to uh, use like what you would see in cbasp right so uh cognitive behavioral analysis system of psychotherapy uh which is kind of similar to rodbt uh, which is, is a whole other conversation, but um, I'm looking to see in those situations, what do you, what do you want? What do you have control over? What, 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 what can you do to move towards it? Um, yeah. So, so typically, so the, thematically, I know I'm saying a lot, but thematically I'm trying to pull it back to what do you have control over? What are you going to do? What are your options? So eliciting change talk, uh, freedom, freedom to choose absence of alternatives. Um, and someone had asked a question if there were any data that you found that um, the collaborative approach results in a better outcome than the provided discovery approach. I love that. That's so nice. Uh, I don't know that we have that, right? I don't know that. I mean, there is there are studies showing that when people use Socratic questioning, it leads to improvements, but I don't know that there's that there's head to head comparisons across that. Right. So, so this is one of those like um theoretical uh the orthodoxy of cbt like this is what we think this is what we do but like we haven't we haven't had that kind of dismantling study and so if, if there are some people who say people can only get a certain amount better and you know if, if we if we get them there with right discovery or guide discovery what's what does it matter what's the difference and that is something that we don't actually know from an empirical, empirical perspective clinically or conceptually i would say there's more skills training that goes with teaching people a skill set to help with relapse prevention and help them learn to manage problems in the future. But even with that, I don't have data to say that. That's just what I think. So somebody asked again um, a similar question to something we discussed before, but what if you what do you do if you find evidence that does support the belief in some way? Mm -hmm. So for example, if someone who's upset about being selfish but actually mm -hmm. does struggle mm -hmm. uh, with giving towards others, so we know the label's not helpful, but what do you do if the evidence actually fits the bill? Oh, yes. I love that question. This is so good. <clears throat> right. So similar, like if we're talking about like, inappropriate guilt, if someone actually like should feel guilty because they did do something wrong. Um, the, the goal isn't that isn't to make people isn't to placate people right? the goal isn't to like make someone feel better about themselves because they're paying us to make them feel better. Right? We're not companions in that way. Right. That That is a, a different profession, which is not a bad profession, but it's a different profession than what we do. Um, so in those situations, you know, the, the idea is, is the person has a set of values, they have, they have ideas how they want to live by, we help them evaluate those values. If they have done something that, uh, so, so the um, selfish and are they actually behaving selfishly, that's an easier example to work with, right? So I, I might have someone who I'm working with who's coming in and says something like, um, you know, I feel really bad because like my wife says I don't listen to her. And then like, as we get into the evidence, they're actually not listening to her. You know, that's, then I'm pragmatically saying, well, here's your options, right? You can keep, you can keep not, you can keep uh, feeling bad for not doing this, or I can help you learn to pay attention to your wife. And then like, lo and behold, like, hey, I started listening to her and things got better. Oh my God. If we had two hours, I would tell you about that case. That was fascinating. But it was like all this like self-monitoring, all this stuff. And at the end of the day, he was just, I just wasn't listening when she was talking. It's like, oh, I just, I learned like, I just like pay attention to what she's saying. Like, it just works better. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll work that way. Um, so yeah, so behavior change, right? If, so many people need to not only 
So the cognitive model is not, from my view, is not everything is a thinking problem. The cognitive model is that it's not just what happens that affects how you feel, but it's how you make sense of it, how you interpret it. So the, the goal isn't just change how you think, feel better. It's learn to mentally take a step back, disengage from your automatic thought patterns, think, think uh, in a more reasoned way, but, but then live a life that's in line with your values because of that. So I very so I do periodically have sessions where I have to say, you know, it sounds like you kind of were just like a real asshole here. I kind of I kind of think like I see where she's coming from. You know, and I, I feel like that's also good good therapy as well sometimes. The reality check, right? Well, I mean, if the, that's, that's where the data is, right? I mean, and if you get there from the data and you could say, you know, I didn't think we were gonna get here, but like from where I'm looking at this, like this, I, this looks like you I see there's a problem here. I'm concerned about this. Uh, but if you can get that, but I mean, if, if the problem is like you, you think your client is actually sociopathic and actually has empathy deficits, that's unlikely to be the, the person who's self-reporting and coming in for therapy. Um, it's, or, it's, there's probably a compassionate conceptualization, right? There's probably some reason it makes sense. It's probably some way this behavior was learned, perhaps a trauma response or some kind of compensatory strategy from something else. So. But that doesn't mean that there, there might not need to be a behavior change as well. But there's, it's just so contextual, right? Everything we do is so contextual. So I was saying a lot, but the main idea is sometimes the, the so the, that's an easy one, right? So this idea of like, they feel selfish, they're acting selfish. A harder one is, so a mother who comes in, they think they're a bad mother and their kids have been removed because they've been using meth. And it was like, there was um, several times they were warned about it and the kids are taken out and they feel terrible about it. And the kids were removed because of them, right? That's a, that's a, it's a much more challenging thing because there is, by definition, there has been some failings. But does this have to be the whole story? Is there a path towards redemption? Yes. Is there a path towards everyone else forgiving you and acting like this never happened? Maybe not. And there's kind of a whole, whole uh, re reconstructing process that can go with that. But the goal is to recognize that it's not just people thinking negatively and not think positively, because that's that's cheap CBT. That's not NYC CBT. That's like someone else. We're doing good stuff here. Uh, I think our timing is actually perfect, right? Oh, now. this was so um, fun. So this is going to be available for people to watch later when they want to yes. when they want to watch it. Then write me emails and say like, Scott, how dare you say this? <laughs> exactly right. So anybody who registered uh, for the workshop will have access to the video. Um, and for people asking again about um, the CEs, you will get an email after after Zoom registers your attendance. Just have to take a quick short survey and you'll get the CE certificate. Um, and if any problems, just email us. And I want to thank everybody for coming and um, my co-moderator, um, Dr. Lindsay Tolchin, who was great with the questions and then of course um our tech jason because we'd be jason. lost without him jason's amazing and scott just a really special thank you this was fantastic can't wait for the book um oh, and thank you we really appreciate all your time that's so nice i would say just to plug jason who does so much work for us i did do an episode of uh, jason's uh podcast sanity podcast so check it out it's on all all the podcast things so yep. excellent this was fun. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, I guess roll credits. Yeah, yeah roll credits. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so everybody. much, Scott. This is great.